It is two hours since the polls closed in Alabama, and we still don't know. Here's what we've got in terms of the latest vote count. Right now, we've got 72% of the vote in. I did not think we'd have 72% in uh, by 10 o'clock, but we do. And right now, it's too close to call. Roy Moore with a slim lead over Doug Jones, a little bit less than 23,000 votes between them, a 51-48% split right now, with just under three quarters of the vote in. Again, Doug Jones can't in his campaign, his supporters right now, really keeping a close eye on uh, the big, most populated counties in the state, including uh, Birmingham and Montgomery and Mobile uh, and Huntsville. Um, we do not have complete results from the counties uh, where any of those cities are located, and that's supposed to be the real stronghold, not just in terms of the proportion by which Doug Jones is expected to win there, but the sheer number of votes he's due to get out of those places. So still very exciting. That does it for us tonight. We will see you again tomorrow. Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Rachel. And anyone who's wondering what the age of Trump has done to the Republican Party, the last time, the last time this Senate seat was up for election was just 2014, just three years ago. And the Republican won with 97% of the vote. <laughs> the Democrats could not get a candidate on the ballot. They couldn't talk anyone into running for Senate in Alabama. So if, we're, if you're wondering how far we have come, this yeah. is how far we have come. Yeah, this, and this is going to be, I, I, I kept thinking about this today, that this is going to be really a titanic result for both parties Regardless of who wins, it would be a huge freaking deal if Doug Jones wins. It would be a huge freaking deal if Roy Moore wins. Uh, but even before we've got those final results, the fact that it is this tight, that it's still too close to call with now 72% of the vote in, that itself is a really big deal in terms of understanding American politics uh, at this point in our lives. And, and one more history point. Uh, this is how long ago it's been since we've had a Senate race this close in Alabama between the Democrat and Republican. 1986 was the last time it was this close, and I want to get the exact number. Uh, the, the, the winner got 50.3% of the vote. The loser got 49.7% wow. of the vote. And I'm masking this a little bit because the winner who just squeaked it out was Richard Shelby, and he won Once, as, as a, a Democrat. Democrat. That's, That's how right. he entered the Senate in 1986, was as a Democrat changed parties uh, eight years later. Uh, so uh, when they're this close, historically, <laughs> the Democrat wins. So That's we right. will and, see. <laughs> and the last time we had a major statewide race just won by a Democrat in Alabama, it was 11 years ago, 2006, it was a lieutenant governor's race, where the Democrat who won beat Luther Strange, mm -hmm. who's the guy whose Senate seat was just vacated uh, in order to make space for this special election tonight. It is the, uh, it is, it, this is, it's, it's one of those things that's super fun to cover, but also tonight, super suspenseful. Yeah, we are, we're making history as we sit here. Thank yeah. you, Rachel. Thanks, Lawrence. Well, as Alabama continues to count votes, here is where things stand at this hour. The race is officially too close to call with Roy Moore at 50%, Doug Jones at 48%. 77% of the vote is in. We're going to bring in NBC's Steve Kornacki. Steve, what are you watching? Uh, well, yeah, it, look, this is, it's a 21,000 vote lead right now for Roy Moore. That's what Jones has to make up. So if Jones is going to make it up, let me show you where he's got to get it right now. A couple places we're watching very closely. About 80% of the vote in, is in in Madison County. This is Huntsville. This is the second, the, the county with the second highest share of college degrees in the state. This is a place the Jones campaign targeted. They're probably going to get some more of a margin out of there. Here's the biggie, though. Birmingham, the suburbs around it, the largest county in the state, the single biggest vote-producing part of the state. Jones is cleaning up here. There's still a third of the vote to come in. He can get a lot more votes out of Jefferson County. And the third place to be looking here, Mobile, only a third of the vote in. Again, Jones cleaning up here. And, and also, we all add a fourth one here. There's still vote out, about a quarter of the vote in Montgomery. So four big places there on the map. Again, if you're Jones, you're trying to make up 21,000 votes right now. Now, if you're Moore and you still want to pull this thing out, you've got scattered precincts in the rural parts of the state that are still coming in. So we can get some votes there. But there's two biggies for Moore, the Republican, right now. Number one, this is Shelby County. This is the suburbs outside Birmingham. This is, the, uh, this is a place here. Look, Donald Trump got 73% of the vote in this county in 2016. So Moore is running well behind that. A lot of college degrees here. It'll still be a more win, but this is the problem for more right now. He's trying.
trying to hold off Jones, who has those big counties left where he's going to get a lot of numbers. He needs a place like Shelby to come through big. It normally does for Republicans. He's only getting 58 percent. This is a terrible number for a Republican in Shelby County. If this is what he's getting, is that going to be enough to hold off Jones? One other place on the map then for more to look. It is Baldwin County, the eastern shore. This is outside Mobile. Okay, again, about a quarter of the vote left here. Moore wants to probably be at about 65 percent or better, really north of 65 percent. Your Trump got 77 percent in this county last year. So again, 63. Hey, he's going to win it. He's going to get votes out of here. But with what Jones is going to get out of these other places, is that going to be enough? Look, we'll see when the votes come in. I'll say this, though. We talked for weeks leading up to this about what it would take for a Democrat to win Alabama. Not just black support, but heavy black turnout. We have evidence of very strong black turnout in the heavily black parts of this state. Then the question of, in those metro areas around the state, can you get those traditionally Republican voters to break away from the party? We are seeing that breakage occur across the state. So look, the basic ingredients are there. And by the way, the margin now down to 13,000. The basic ingredients are there. This is a narrow race. It's a question of is it going to be just enough or is it going to be just short for Democrats? But again, this is sort of if they're ever going to win one, Lawrence, probably be in the next hour or two. Steve, as I'm staring at your map, uh, we're watching Jones closing the gap as you speak. Uh, and so with what you're looking at there, who has more, who has richer uncounted vote territories there as, as they await these, this vote count? Yeah, I mean, look, again, there's, there's basically three big areas here left. I, and I'm just seeing, I'm doing this to see if the numbers have changed while I'm up here. It's still a third in Mobile. You still got a third left. Uh, in, in, this is the biggest source of votes in the state. Now, the one thing is this Jones percent of the vote might come down a little bit as the last precincts come in here, the final third come in. So he may not win at the same clip here. Uh, and again, let's see if anything more, came, a few more came in here uh, in Madison County. These are the biggest areas left. You know, there's a lot of Democratic turf here. I'm trying to avoid giving you an exact answer because it really <laughs> looks about <laughs> even. But uh, again, I, I'm struck by more running, you know, probably not where he wants to be. And, and if that holds, if he's only getting 58 percent in Shelby, uh, again, I thought he probably needed about 62, 63 in a county like Shelby. Uh, Steve, just yell over to us whenever he has something new to report. You We're going to be coming back to you. Steve Kornacki, thank you very much. Really appreciate sure. it. We're joined now from Alabama, from Birmingham, Alabama, by Joyce Vance. She's a professor, professor of law at the University of Alabama, a Ford, former federal prosecutor in Alabama. And here in New York, Joy Reid is with us. Joyce Vance, uh, being on the ground there in Alabama, uh, what is your sense of where we stand tonight? Well, this race is obviously still too close to call, but it looks like the Jones campaign is close to meeting its targets. Heavy turnout we're hearing in many of the urban areas. In Birmingham, many boxes are coming in at 40 to 50 percent of the population went out and voted. That's compared to the Secretary of State's estimate that only 25 percent of the population would vote. And that would be very good news for the Jones campaign if it holds up. Also, it looks like he's performing ahead of schedule with white Republican voters, particularly women. That was another segment of the vote that he targeted. Still too early to call, but as these last few uh, big outposts that are Democratic come in, we'll get a better idea of where we're headed. Uh, Joy Reid, uh, as I said to Rachel at the beginning of the show, the last time this seat uh, was up for election was 2014. The Republican Jeff Sessions got 97 percent <laughs> of the vote and yeah. the Democrats couldn't find anyone to run against him. So in the age of Trump, the Republicans in Senate races in Alabama have lost 47 percent of the vote right off the top. Yeah, and, it's, and you know, people forget that, you know, even in terms of statewide elections, Alabama did not become a solidly Republican state until 2010. You know, it took a long time for the sort of um, backlash from the civil rights movement to completely wash over these southern states. States like Alabama, until Obama came along, you still had people who would at, at the local level would vote for Democrats. There wasn't a complete aversion to voting for Democrats. You just had people like, to the point you made, Richard Shelby switch sides and Alabama has been voting Republican for president since, you know, 68, they went for Wallace, yeah. but after that they've been Republican. So it's a weird state. And what's interesting, over the course of the night, what I've been hearing from people um, in, in Alabama has been concern over 
voter suppression over people showing up at precincts in places like Montgomery County, having only one or two people there to check IDs and it being really overwhelming long lines. That said to me, black turnout has to be really high because when black turnout is high, that's when you get more suppression activity. And, and the suppression, we mean registered voters showing up at the poll, they don't have the ID. We're going to go back to Steve Kornacki, see what's new on the board. Steve Kornacki, what do you have? Yeah, well, actually, nothing new. We're, we're still at 515, 501, about a 14,000 vote gap. I, I'll give you one here that we're keeping a very very close eye on, though. Jefferson County, again, this is the biggest source of votes outstanding uh, Mobile and Jefferson right now. To give you some sense of this, though, when Roy Moore was on the ballot in this state in 2012 and he nearly lost that race for chief justice, he got 37 percent of the vote in this county. Again, right now, we, we got to see where these precincts are exactly. I think that number is going to tick up a little bit. But again, if he's running below that level here uh, in Jefferson, that means there's a lot more votes for Jones to get out of here. So uh, okay, now we're down to 13,000. I'll go back to you. I'm going to see where these came, but the gap now stands at 13,000 votes statewide for Jones, uh, Lawrence. Wow, it is closing. Uh, Jerry Spence, in, in your anecdotal experience talking to voters as you have been for the last uh, few weeks in, in Alabama, have you been surprised by any of the reactions? It's a very interesting race, and I think one um, mistake that I often hear people making is viewing it in context of national politics. This is really very much a race that's based on trends in Alabama over the last couple of decades, many of the trends that Joy was talking about. So as I'm talking to people, I'm hearing a lot of very Alabama-specific detail. Moore's voters like Moore. They're unlikely to stray. Doug Jones's voters have been following his trajectory and his movement in civil rights for many years. What's most interesting has been watching women talk to other women, Jones supporters talking to traditional Republican voters, and seeing these groups actually come together to some extent and, and make some progress in talking to each other and working through issues. If a positive trend comes out of this election, it will be that coming together. And, uh, uh, Joy, uh, Richard Shelby, when he last ran, 2016, last year, he got 64 percent of the vote. Democrat got 35.9 uh, percent of the vote. You know, you, you think of Alabama as being just this impenetrable spot for, uh, for Democrats. But if you were to compare that to, say, New York, <laughs> where Chuck Schumer got 70 percent of the vote. Right. Uh, and New York is capable of electing Republicans statewide. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a strange state because it has a very high percentage of African-American voters, which is usually an indicator that Democrats should be able to win statewide. But the white vote is as polarized in the direction of Republicans as the black vote is polarized in the direction of Democrats. And so Barack Obama, even with super high turnout um, from African-Americans, he only got like 10, 11 percent of the white vote uh, in 2008. And then not much more of that in 2012. I think he actually did even worse in 2012. So it's a very impenetrable state because the vote is so racially polarized. So it's an interesting state. But yeah, I mean, up until, listen, the state, you was, you, these other states used to be considered states you could win, right? I mean, Ronald Reagan went to Mississippi to win that. You know, I think somebody sitting next to me talked about that on her show once. Uh, we're, we're, joined now, we're joined now by Rachel Maddow, who's, who's made it down the hall. Uh, Rachel, can you hold for a second? We're going to go to Steve Kornacki and see what the latest is at the board. Yeah, uh, Lawrence, again, uh, some more voters come in on both sides here. The gap still sits at 13,000, but I think if there's a significant development, we're talking about these places, the big places left on the map where there's a lot of votes still out. There's one that's pretty much all filled in now. Baldwin County, again, it's outside Mobile. This is a traditionally very Republican county. Almost all the votes in. You see, this is a significant, I think, Moore's margin here. It's a little over 13,000. It'll probably end up about 14 or 15,000 when all 100% are in here. But a normal night here, uh, if it was was like Donald Trump level support for a Republican, the margin would be 28,000, about 28, 29, 30,000. You see, it's basically half of that, a little better than half of that margin for more tonight. So again, you can pretty much take Baldwin off the board. He's going to get 13 or 14,000 vote margin out of here, though. That's not what a Republican normally gets. And again, we still got a lot here in Jefferson. We still got Mobile. Only a third of Mobile is, is in. We've still got, you know, 15% to come out of, of Huntsville, Matt in that area, so there's still a lot of Democratic vote out there. Uh, I might add Montgomery County. Look at this, we got a lot left there. So, look, is that enough 
for the Republican out of that big Republican county. Uh, it looks like it's pretty much off the board now. Uh, Steve, it's never been more exciting watching one of your boards. And, and Rachel, and stay, Steve, stay in the discussion with us here. Uh, Rachel, uh, your reaction to what you're watching there on Steve's well, boards. Well, just that very specific data we were just getting from him. Baldwin County, whether or not you know anything about Baldwin County, there's one thing to know about it for Roy Moore. When he barely won that seat on the Supreme Court in 2012 against Bob Vance, he got 65% of the vote in Baldwin County. He's now getting 61% of the vote in Baldwin yeah. County. And that is the sort of thing that might be a rounding error in a typical election, <laughs> right. just like those 18,000 votes for some random write-in might be, a, might be a, a, a rounding error in a regular election. But if it's going to be this close, this, that's absolutely what could be the difference. Steve, that's what you've been looking for all night, the spots where Roy Moore is underperforming. Yeah, it, there's, and there's two types of underperforming, I think, here, if you're Roy Moore. One is if you're just not running at the level of Republicans. I'll give you a classic example of that. I think one of the worst counties we've seen for a minute. There's actually two I'll give you. Collegiate theme here. Number one, uh, that, well, sorry, it's supposed to be... There we go. Lee County, this is the home of Auburn University. So, look, Donald Trump got 59% here. When Roy Moore almost lost four, uh, five years ago for chief justice, he still won this county. He got 53% of the vote tonight. He only got 41% of the vote. And so, again, that theme the Jones campaign had of trying to get traditionally Republican college-educated voters, this is the kind of place they were looking for. Moore goes 12 points under what he got when he nearly lost uh, a few years ago. Another place, look across the state, big rivalry in college, Tuscaloosa, University of Alabama. Again, Roy Moore, when he ran and almost lost five years ago, 48% in this county, only coming in with 41% tonight. We still have some vote left, but it looks like he's going to be south of what he got in that near miss five years ago. So he's underperforming there. Those are the kinds of counties Jones was looking for. But the second kind of underperforming, talked about this a lot with Rachel, we're looking at rural areas up here with largely white populations, rural areas down here, largely white populations. You go into these individual <laughs> counties and Moore's percentage is huge. You say, oh, great night for Roy Moore. Problem for Roy Moore is the turnout here, not nearly as impressive as the turnout we're seeing in this part of the state, the heavily black counties, heavily Democratic counties. So again, that's another kind of underperforming if your base doesn't have the kind of energy that your opponent's base has. So there's two sorts of underperforming, I think, uh, if you're looking at this. And I'm just killing time to see if we got an update. We do. <laughs> Jones has polled within 3,000 votes. I'm oh, going to just boy. see if we can see. Where, see, look at this. You still got more than a quarter of the vote out in Birmingham and the suburbs. And Jones is within 3,000 right now. That's very significant. You still got more than half the vote to come in out of Mobile, where Jones's lead is over is a 10,000 votes, over 10,000 votes right now. Still half the vote to come, and again, he's within 3,000 statewide. Take a look up here in Madison. You still have 15 percent to come in. He's got a 17-point lead right now. He's going to get more votes out of here, more votes out of here, more margin out of here, and he's within 3,000 statewide. Uh, and one more, I just want to check while I'm here. Yeah, this is the big one left for Roy Moore. You got a third of the vote left in Shelby County. You're right outside Birmingham. You're in the suburbs. Donald Trump got 73% of the vote here in 2016. If Roy Moore was getting 73% of the vote in, uh, what did I press here? If Roy Moore was getting 73% of the vote in Shelby County, and you told me 37% of Shelby County is still to come in, I'd say Roy Moore's going to get a lot of votes here. If you tell me Roy Moore's only getting 58% in Shelby County, and you still got 37% to come in, and you tell me Jones has all those areas left, I say, I don't know if that's going to be enough for Roy Moore. Well, Rachel, that tells us that a lot of uh, Donald Trump voters in Alabama do not do what Donald Trump asks them to do when it comes to a Senate race like this. That's true. And, you know, Alabama voters are um, their own thing. And they've had their own opinions about Roy Moore all this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Roy Moore was thrown off the state Supreme Court not once. But twice, which means the voters put him back on after he was thrown off the first time. But I am struck, and I'm really happy that Steve is putting it in this frame, because yep, for me at least it makes it crystal clear, that Alabama voters turned against Roy Moore from the last time he had to run. I mean, in Jefferson County right now, we've got 72% in. That's the most populous county in the state. More votes come out of that county than anywhere else. When he ran in 2012, he yep. was getting 37% we of the vote there. Now he's at 22% of the vote there. And that's, again, we don't have all of it in. Something will change when we get in the rest of that vote. But to be dramatically underperforming his own 
performance from five years ago shows you that the allegations did make a difference. And maybe the national climate made a difference. And maybe the president made a difference. But Alabama does not feel the same way they did about Roy Moore the last time they had a chance to say. Uh, we're gonna, Steve Kornacki, we're coming back to you at the board. What do you have there now? We, I, it's a small dump of votes that just came in, but now you can see Jones has moved within 1,400 votes of wow. Roy Moore. So again, that's a high school. Razor 1,400 wide, votes. But it, when it gets this close, oh, we got another. Jones has taken the lead. There we are. The margin now is 817 votes. So to reset. With 87% of the vote counted statewide, the Democrat, Doug Jones, is now taking the lead. I can guarantee you this is the latest into the night a Democrat has led a race with the United States Senate in Alabama since 1986 when you had that razor-thin, excuse me, since 1992, uh, the last time a Democrat won a Senate race there. Uh, so Jones has the lead right now. But again, what becomes more significant is what is still outstanding, more than half of Mobile County. This is a place that Roy Moore couldn't even win when he ran for chief justice five years ago. That is still outstanding. Look at this. 28% here in Jefferson County, where Jones is cleaning up. Still outstanding. Madison County, Huntsville area, we still have over 10% of the vote. Still outstanding. You have scattered rural precincts around the state that are still coming in for more at 70, 80% clip. So he's still going to get votes. But again, the biggest single concentration, I think, that's left here for more is Shelby County, is these suburbs. He's getting a 6,000 vote margin out of here. He's got a third of the, the precincts still outstanding. He will add to that, but think about that. If he's only getting 58% and there's only a third left here, roughly, what kind of margin is that going to produce when you're looking? Look, if you're Jones and you're looking at this map, you're pretty happy right now. Steve, we're canceling your coffee break. We're going to have to keep a camera on you and the board. Uh, and if you want to make a private comment here or there, let us know. But we're going to be coming back to you. And feel free to uh, overrule anyone on the panel and jump in whenever you have to. Uh, uh, Joy, I just want to go to uh, something uh, Howell Rains, who was here last last night, who's from Alabama, was the executive editor of the New York Times for many years. He talked about his own travels in Alabama recently and how he, he would go into places where there, there wasn't a single Roy Moore lawn sign, and there should have been. Yeah. And, and that was a fascinating conversation. And, you know, it's funny because as you're talking, I'm getting texts in that are saying, Mobile and Jefferson, just yeah. as Steve is talking, are not, are not in. And, you know, the reality is I spoke to a long time political, you know, white gentleman who's you know, been in politics down there a long time who said, look, the reality is Roy Moore is really not that popular. He has a base that's rabidly his and that really love him. But is he that popular? No, he wins by very low margins when he wins. And that he tends to have won in low turnout off your elections. So special elections, and even if he pulls it out tonight, he's not a lock for 2020 because he's not as popular as sort of the rest of the sort of the national community looks at him and thinks that he is. So he's got a softness problem in, in his base, in, in sort of his popularity. And then the other thing is that there's been a suppressive, it looks like, effect, a sort of a demoralization among his, his base, that maybe he's not getting the enthusiasm, whereas the other side is very fired up. And then I think the third thing I would throw in is think of the, the uh, Trump voter in a similar way you think of the Obama voter. And what I mean by that is that there are some voters who really vote for that presidential mm -hmm. candidate, and that presidential candidate can compel them when they themselves are on the ballot. But when they're not on the ballot, you're not necessarily going to get that marginal voter who came out for Trump in 2016 to come back out just because he told them. Okay, to. we're going to go back to Steve every time one of us <laughs> finishes a paragraph. Uh, just to see, Steve, what, what are the latest numbers there? Yeah, I, look, again, Jones's lead right now, with the quick math here, it's about 577 right now. Uh, another place, I, I forgot to include this, Montgomery, we still have outstanding vote here. Uh, again, Jones is cleaning up. So look, the places where you got significant outstanding vote. Okay, now we just got some more. Let me see if this affected the statewide. There you go. Uh, Jones now has taken a 5,400 vote lead statewide. So here we've been talking about it. We've been saying, when are we going to get another dump from uh, Mobile? We just did. You can see now Jones still steadily leading. We got 57% in, and that's what's going to happen. Every time we get sort of a jolt of data, and there's still going to be a few left here in, in Mobile County, in a place like this, it is going to add big time to Jones's total. So at the start of this hit, I said I think it was about a 500 vote lead. It is now more than a 5,000 vote lead. And again, that will continue. There's a lot of vote left in Mobile. Take a look in Jefferson County here. There's a lot of vote left in Jefferson County. There's not a lot, but there's still some vote left in Madison County. Looks like there is still vote left in Montgomery. Every time you get more votes from these places, that Jones statewide total, look at that. It is now up to 11,000 statewide. Is that Mobile sending more in? We got a little bit more in Mobile. Let's see if we got a little bit more uh, in Birmingham. I, I find out where the rest of it came from. But look, that pattern is going to continue, I think, 
think, for the next few minutes now. Jones is opening up a lead in this thing, and I, I'm just I'm looking at this, and I am not seeing where Roy Moore can get the. Uh, I mean, again, this is the way I keep coming back. I'm broken record with Shelby County. He's got to generate, this is his biggest single source of potential Republican votes left on the map here. It's a 6,000 vote lead. It, first of all, it should be more right now if you're a normal Republican. It should be up more than 6,000 votes. And I, you know, it, it, it's only 37% left. How are you going to overcome? Seeing if we had more there, you can't. It, it just, you're, we're going to keep getting this. It's up to, it's, it's 11,000 votes right now. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, every, I'll shout to you every time we get more in. But that's going to, I think that number is going to keep going up right now. Now. All right, we're going to keep watching it. We're going to Fairhope, Alabama right now. We're going to be joined by Howell Raines, former executive editor of The New York Times. Howell Raines joined us last night. Uh, Howell, which, which county are, are you in tonight? I'm in uh, Baldwin County uh, where, uh, as Steve Kornacki just said, uh, uh, D uh, Doug Jones is running, uh, I think, getting what he needs to get. I must say that listening to Steve Kornacki talk about this race through my earphone is like listening to Eli Gold call a Crimson Tide football game. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it, it is a very exciting race and I think we're, it's potentially a historic one. This will be a, a, a watershed for Alabama and, and I think what we're seeing, the pattern we're seeing, not just the urban vote for, for Doug Jones, but the slippage for Roy Moore in the rural parts of the state. I mean, it's tremendously uh, significant. I think Steve was right to emphasize uh, Doug Jones carrying Auburn University, which is a conservative school lodged in a very conservative county. Hillary Clinton only got 36% of the vote there, and Jones is running away with it. And uh, what I would like to add is this, I think, has real implications for the national political scene and for Donald Trump's Washington. Because what this election tells me is with a vigorous centrist candidate, you can start to shrink Trump's famous base, because that's what's happening here. This is one of the strongest Trump bases in the country, and it's, it's being fractured before our eyes. Howell, we got to go right back to Steve Kornacki because there are still developments on the board. Steve, what do you have now? Yeah, let's uh, give you the statewide count. Still sits at 11,000, but I've just been looking. There. So we said, where else could Moore get votes? He's now behind. He's got to manufacture votes. His campaign talked about the Wiregrass region. They said, this is going to be the heart and soul of Roy Moore's victory. You're looking down in this part of the state. Every single red county in the area I, I just circled here, if you can call that a circle, has 100% of the precincts reporting. He's not getting any more votes out of there. He's cleaning up right there. I mean, look at these, uh, look at these, go to the northern part of the state, if this board will let me. Go to the northern part of the state. 100% is in. You know, 100% uh, is in. These are more counties here. 100% is in. He's not getting more votes out of here. And meanwhile, go to the gigantic population centers. Take a look in Mobile. There's a lot more votes coming out of Mobile. There are are a lot more votes coming out of Jefferson. So again, I, I don't. I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm trying to give you some kind of more scenario. I can't come up with one because I think this Jones uh, support, this, uh, this Jones margin sitting at 11,000, is going to continue to go up. And you know, again, Shelby's the only place I can look at. Uh, it's the same story I've been telling. You. We don't have new vote in, but that's just not an impressive margin for more there. I mean, it, it's he did not. So we are not seeing. It, it, it's the suburban voters, the traditionally uh, Republican suburban voters, and those college towns. I think the college towns are a key point in this. Auburn, uh, Tuscaloosa. Uh, they're just not enth enthusiastic here uh, for more. He's not getting the levels of support. He's not getting the turnout. Turnout through the roof comparatively in these heavily black areas. Here we go. Now up to a, a 12,000 vote margin statewide for Jones. So again, he, he continues to lead with a lot of outstanding votes. It was, that was a little bit more in Mobile that just came in. That's where that, uh, that's where that margin is. Basically up to a 12,000 vote advantage, though. Rachel, uh, Howell Reigns told us last night to expect a vote like this that would defy the stereotype about mm -hmm. Alabama that Roy Moore personifies. And it's been interesting to watch over the course of this past week, um, Alabama Democrats, um, Alabama never Trump Republicans, um, people who are not um, just writing about the state and covering the state as outsiders, but people who are from there, have been articulating, saying, I know you guys out there in the national media don't believe me, yes. but I believe, and I don't think I'm just hoping and wishing, I believe that this is actually going to be a Doug Jones race. And we heard that from a lot of, a lot of Alabamians, actually, who felt that there was, um, at least the case that was made to me, is that it was hard to make an empirical case for it. It's hard to prove it. You can't say that yard signs tell you how, a, how an election's going to go, but there was something going on in the state that people who are in Alabama natives could see coming uh, here. And uh, I think the, 
national media actually was um, humble enough to not make too many predictions here. But this is going to very, very late in the night. It's interesting, too, when it's this close and when it's this late in the night that we're deciding something like those write-in votes could end up being really important. Richard Shelby, the senior senator from Alabama, didn't say vote for Doug Jones. Yeah. He said write in somebody else. And if we've got 20,000 write-in votes, that may matter. That could be it. Uh, Howell Reigns, uh, I'm thinking of that married couple that you mentioned in your op-ed piece uh, the other day. I think the bishops of their name. Your, your grandfather uh, presided at their wedding 72 years ago, uh, and the husband said to you that he he was going to try to sway his wife to vote for Doug Moore, and his wife said to you very emphatically, no, he's not. Uh, is that the story? I think it is the story, and, and I'm glad you brought up Winston County. Uh, Winston County is the most independent thinking county in the state, and, I'm not, and I think the pattern that we detected statewide of women standing up and figuring out this race in a way that uh, perhaps more quickly, that certainly, than the more people did is significant. And I wanted to also note that Winston County went 90 percent for Trump, and the last figure I heard was that uh, he, uh, uh, Moore was only getting about in the low 80s there, which that's a small, small amount, but that slippage is what's killing him uh, right now. Uh, Steve Kornacki, you've gotten the uh, best review you could possibly get. Howell Reigns says you're calling this just right uh, on an Alabama election. Uh, what's the latest? Yeah, I, I mean, let's take the uh, statewide. So, again, we're sitting at about 11,500. Here's, if we got to get really granular, because I think we do, there just isn't much left. Basically, every red county you see on the map right now, except for one, is 100% in. So, this is the one place, excuse, there's two, actually, I should say. There's one that has a few left. This is the one place where there's significant, the one red county right now where there's significant vote outstanding. That's Shelby County. We've been talking about it. Moore is going to win it. He's going to get more of a margin out of this, but this is not anywhere near the margin Republicans normally get. This was a 73% Donald Trump county. He's winning it at a 58% clip right now. That is a, a, a sort of disastrous number for him. There are a few precincts left here in Baldwin County. I think that's where Howell Reigns said he was, if I heard right. So, But again, you're, there's not much left here. You know, it might be another 1,000 votes if he's lucky that comes Roy Moore's way uh, in Baldwin County. So the only other hope I think he has right now when you look at these, okay, we got a few more in now, so we can, it's about a 13,000 vote lead. It's inched up a little bit more. Let's see if we can see where that came in. I think Mobile here, uh, was it in Jefferson County? It was not in Jefferson County. Was it in Madison County? It looks like a little bit more Madison County came in. So you see, again, Jones winning this at a healthy clip. Few more votes come in. The statewide total inches up about 2,000 votes from almost done now in Madison County. I think the one thing I, I would say when you look at Jefferson County, if you're more, is look, there's a city there, Birmingham, and then there are suburbs. So again, Roy Moore got 37% of the vote total in this county in 2012. He's running obviously well behind that. The hope for Moore would be that the city of Birmingham is all in, and some of those Republican suburbs account for the lion's share of the outstanding vote, and maybe he can win those suburbs, bring his uh, uh, countywide total up a little bit, you know, could somehow make up a, a margin there. But again, the suburbs of Jefferson County are exactly the suburbs that the Jones campaign has been targeting. You're talking about voters here with college degrees, suburbanites, professional class. These are the folks we've been seeing across the state who are moving away from more. So to make up a margin, let's see if we got, let's see if we can uh, go out statewide here. Yes, to make up 13,000 votes with what Jones still has coming in in Mobile, what Jones probably, a little bit that he still has here. And we can check Montgomery County, see if we get a little bit more. You know, it, it's it's tough to see. It really would be a combination of Shelby County and some suburban precincts uh, in Jefferson County. That's the math that, that, that Moore would need right now to come from behind. But, but wow, he's, uh, I think it's safe to say in modern times, he finds himself in uncharted territory right now for an Alabama Republican. Thanks, Steve. The reason we've been splitting the screen with Jones headquarters there, which uh, we could go back to now, you'll, you'll see there's been a lot of cheering there because, as I think Joy Reid knows, because she's been checking uh, her phone, some news organizations have already called this race for Doug Jones. NBC News is not ready to do that. And Joy, uh, there seems to be a lesson in here somewhere for the Democrats on how to turn out the black vote, which turned out in a, in a higher rate than for Barack Obama running in Alabama. Yeah, absolutely. And early 
on in the Doug Jones campaign, there was some criticism that his message to African American voters was too simplistic. It was just about the four little girls prosecution and it wasn't broad enough. But I think that message actually fired up the Jones campaign. They started to diversify that message. They brought in Cory Booker, Barack Obama. There was a real get out the vote effort. You have to remember, these southern states have the highest black populations in the country. So in theory, if they have a higher percentage of black voters than Michigan, they should be able to do what Michigan can do and elect someone statewide or Ohio. You know, 26% of the population of Alabama is African American. If you can get them registered and turn out and protect their votes, I was hearing all night from people out of Alabama talking about voter suppression. But what that said to me is that that turnout has to be really high. I heard about 90 minute and two hour waits at mm -hmm. the polls. Mm -hmm. That means that African Americans are turning out. You get your vote suppressed when you show up. And so that black belt that you see across Steve's map really mattered tonight. And I think so did a bit of demoralization on the part of rural white Republicans who just didn't have their hearts in it for Roy Moore. You know, it should also be noted that the, the Doug Jones campaign is a deep South Democratic campaign that spared no expense and took and had no holds barred. They outspent the Roy Moore campaign on TV six to one. The get out the vote operation they built, they said, was the biggest get out the vote operation ever in the history of Alabama politics. Built from zero. Built yeah. from zero. <laughs> and you saw in a, in a state that ha by definition has to have sort of a weak Democratic Party, you also saw out of state super PAC money come yeah. in to, that was Democratic support. And they, the Democrats saw that Roy Moore, with Roy Moore as an opponent, mm -hmm. they saw, there's Charles Barkley, yes. uh, they saw this as a place that they could try to compete, even though this is a state that starts with A and ends with Alabama. <laughs> and they, if they have pulled it off tonight, this will be a huge shot in the arm for the Democratic notion that Democrats can compete anywhere in the right circumstances. And you know, you, Reggie, you said something very important, uh, which was built from scratch. Because remember, Ro Doug Jones had to actually build that GOTV operation himself. Oh, yeah, Lord. Defunct, yeah. It yeah. Was, it's pretty amazing. And you know, you hear this from southern, you hear this from southern Democrats, particularly from southern black Democrats, all the time, which is we are a a big population, and b we can get close even with no resources. That's right. If you give us a lot of resources right. and some national momentum, you'll be surprised at what we can do. Yeah. I want to go back to Steve at the Lawrence, board. Can Steve, I jump in with a... uh, go ahead, Howell. Go ahead quickly. I want to jump in with a little inside baseball. I've known Joe Trippi since he was the boy wonder of the Mondale campaign in 1984. And the ads that he put up for Doug Jones uh, throughout this campaign, I think, uh, have been the most sophisticated we've seen down here. And I think they've been very effective. And, and Howell, tell us about uh, that white rural voter that uh, Joy Reid was talking about a, a, a minute ago. Uh, what went through the I'm minds sorry, of... I, lo I lost you. Uh, uh, how, well, how Reigns, I don't know if you can still there, hear him. All right, we're going to go to Steve Kornacki, who's at the board. Steve, uh, when we leave you for a minute, the numbers change. We've got to know. Where are we? Yeah, they did change. So now you see Moore is within 10,000 votes here. It looks about 9,200. It's what happened. What I was describing, you know, the Moore campaign, I guess if there's a Hail Mary here, it exists in the suburbs. And we just got, let's see what this did to the statewide total, because I can see we got more. Okay, again, it still sits 9,200. What we're getting here are the remaining precincts of Jefferson County. Remember, for the first however long we've been on the air this hour, about half an hour, I don't have a watch, I can't tell. This was down at about 73%, so you can see it's ticked up to 85%. We've got almost half of the outstanding votes since we've been on the air this hour coming in out of uh, Jefferson County. And you see what it is, is it's suburban precincts, traditionally Republican suburban precincts, where Moore's been doing well enough to eat a little bit, a little bit into the Jones lead. But again, he needs Shelby County. He's going to get a few thousand more here. It looks like he's going to make maybe a little progress in the outstanding counties here in Jefferson. But when you're down, and, and there it is. Look at this. Now you're up. Uh, now it's back to 11,000 uh, uh, statewide. It's an 11,000 vote total. So again, that, that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to keep happening. I want to see where this came in. I think it might have been. Here it is. This is what just happened. So I'll tell you what just happened. I, it's a lot of gibberish here, I realize. While I was speaking, basically the, almost the final precincts came in here in Madison County, Huntsville. And what it is, we've been seeing Jones win this county in a landslide, so Jones's plurality statewide increases. So all of the progress that Moore made probably in the last 10 minutes in some of the precincts here was washed away by what just happened with those precincts that came in in Madison County. Jones is back ahead now by 11,000 statewide. We can basically take Madison off the board, meaning that all that's left in the state right now 
now are the suburban counties, probably in uh, Jefferson County. Moore may be hoping to make a little progress there. He does have the suburban counties here uh, in Shelby, but look at this. You still got all this vote left in Montgomery. In Montgomery, this is a Democratic stronghold. And then you go down here to Mobile, and again, you still have almost a third of the vote left right there. And that is with Jones having a lead of 11,000 right now. This, I mean, this looks like Democratic math. And uh, Mitch McConnell is speaking tonight, uh, not under his own name, but through the leadership packs and funds that he controls. The Senate Leadership Fund, which is devoted to electing Republicans to the Senate, has already given this race uh, to, uh, to, to Jones. And they are saying not only did Steve Bannon cost us a critical Senate seat in one of the most Republican states in the country, but he also dragged the president of the United States into his fiasco. The Republican Senate campaign committee has issued a statement saying, tonight the results are clear. The people of Alabama deemed Roy Moore unfit to serve in the U.S. Senate. I hope Senator-elect Judge Jones will do the right thing and truly represent Alabama by choosing to vote with the Senate Republican majority. Uh, so the Senate Republicans... Uh, wait, wait, they want Doug Jones to vote the with the Senate Republicans? Senate Republicans, Rachel, are welcoming their new colleague, Democrat <laughs> Doug Jones. Who they expect to vote yes. as a Republican. <laughs> They're kind of hoping. I was going to say, that's clever. You know, does Corey... So Cory Gardner's the head of the Republican Senate Campaign Committee. Mm -hmm. Does Cory Gardner get blamed by the ban-in part of the Republican Party and the right for having withheld support for Roy Moore even after the RNC jumped back in and Steve Bannon went down there and did his his act? Well, Mitch McConnell made sure that Steve Bannon's name was in that first press release that went out uh, from the fund that he's also controlling. And, uh, and Joy, this is, this is a devastating night, as it stands at this moment anyway, for Steve, for, for Steve Bannon and Donald Trump. I have two texts from Republican friends. Steve Bannon's in both of them. They're already, people, are, the, kni the long knives will be out for Steve Bannon. He specializes apparently in one thing, losing elections, putting up people who cannot win, <laughs> who draw Democrats to be more excited, to to come out on the other side and to being blustery and fighting the establishment. He claimed he was going to defund Mitch McConnell and establishment Republicans. He's gone down in ignominious defeat tonight. He can be only, he can be nothing but embarrassed tonight. He's not going to have a, an easy time blaming Cory Gardner. Most Americans don't well, know Cory Gardner. Well, but he will. Gardner. I mean, the way, the thing about Steve Bannon is that Bannon has, part of his political genius is that anything that goes against him is never his fault. It's always the fault of somebody who was scheming against him and must be destroyed. So he's the only person who's ever turned getting fired from the White House into <laughs> a promotion, right? Steve Bannon getting fired from the White House was left to everybody talking about how powerful he would That's be in his new post running his website. Can we call it his political technique as opposed to his political yeah, genius? Yeah. I, I it has worked for him thus far, is that he's still the center of conversation right. even when he blows it. Right, let's get back to Steve Kornacki. If we've gone a minute without him, we need to have the new numbers. So we got some new numbers here, and again, holding steady. 95% of the vote is in statewide. Again, Jones continues to lead this thing by 13,000 votes. The storyline remains the same, where basically we can take Madison Huntsville off the board now. That is what, if you said at the start of the day to the Jones campaign, what do you want out of this county? You're looking at it. They got exactly what they wanted out of that county. Uh, you know, again, all that's left, I'm seeing if we got new vote. You know, we got a little bit of Jefferson here. We got, uh, we still got those uh, outstanding votes in Shelby. But again, look at this. You got half the vote in in Montgomery. So a uh, Democratic bastion, there's still vote. Uh, you, got, uh, you got all the votes still to come in uh, in Mobile. Uh, I understand why they're reading those. Uh, I understand we have not characterized it, but I can look at this and understand why you're reading those statements you're reading. I'll put it so, that way. So, Steve, as you look at the map, can you see anywhere where uh, Roy Moore can pull out the votes? <laughs> I, I, here's what I guess would be my best effort at, at putting that together. We have a third of the vote out in Shelby County. I, I can't, I'm not looking here at any individual precinct, so maybe you've got incredible, this is a Republican county, this is a suburban county, this is a place Trump won 73% of the vote last year. So maybe the third that's out is an extraordinarily Republican part of it, and more could put together some, you know, could get a, a, a good plurality out of that. Again, maybe if we're talking about suburban part here, Republican part of Jefferson County, Moore's number, I, you know, I, again, if Moore's not, I could imagine Moore's number here getting into the low 30s, maybe when 100% are in. But to make up the kind of gap, look at this. See, now we're up to you know 13, almost 14,000 right now. 
I can see if that came in, or if we can see where that came in. It was not in Mobile, I can tell you that. Uh, it was not in Jefferson. I'll, I'll track it down one of these times. It was not there. This is a hunt for votes. This, is, this must be great television. Um, look, it's, it's Democratic areas that are, that are basically out here. It's a Democratic candidate leading statewide by 14,000 votes right now. Uh, and it's a Republican who's not doing what Republicans are supposed to do in the suburban parts of the state. So when I, when I look at a suburban area that's left, this is the, this is the big one that's left. I'm, I'm not seeing more get the kinds of numbers that a Republican would need to make up for what Democrats might get uh, in a place like Birmingham. So I mean, Jones is sitting on a lead here of almost 14,000 votes, and, and they're just, there is not a lot of real estate left on that board. And Rachel, uh, yeah. Mitch McConnell has uh, vote counters on these kinds of Senate races that are better than any of us. And mm -hmm. they've decided that it's over. They've decided that Roy Moore has lost. It's at the point where Mitch McConnell's team is putting out press releases blaming Steve Bannon. I yeah. was going to ask you, even before we got that statement, if you thought that Mitch McConnell might have known something that none of us knew at the time, when this afternoon he announced that no matter who won tonight, they definitely wouldn't be sworn in this session. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be put off until next year, until after they can count on Luther Strange to vote for their tax bill and anything and the spending right. bill and anything else they want. When he put out that announcement that whoever wins wasn't going to get sworn in, I wondered if McConnell oh, I, had some I, sense I that this was I saw your tweet down. about that and yeah. I jumped on that because so, oftentimes they are sworn in within a day or two sometimes of these yeah. elections. But it's, it, for the Senate, it's all about getting certified, certified results yes. from a state and Alabama can be relied on to drag its feet <laughs> on, on certifying this new Democratic senator. Uh, go ahead, Steve Kornacki, we're back at you. Yeah, how many times have I, have I been telling you you've been waiting on vote in Shelby County, the one Republican bastion left? It finally came in. Here's what happened. 100 percent in in Shelby County. Roy Moore wins this with 56 percent of the vote. This is dreadful. Donald Trump got 72, 73 percent of here. Uh, here last year, Roy Moore was in the 60s when he nearly lost five years ago. He falls all the way down to 56 percent. His margin here is 9,000. The margin for a Republican in an election like this should be closer to 30,000. He lost basically a 20,000, 20,000 votes that a Republican should have. So look, the final precincts came in there. It does draw more a little closer closer statewide. Remember, the total was inching to 14,000 the last time I talked to you. That was enough to bring it down to 10,200. That's the good news for more. The bad news is that's the last Republican county that's left. <laughs> that's All right. that's left on the map right now. Again, we're just waiting on a little bit there in Jefferson. You got Democratic uh, Mobile here where Jones is winning. You got Montgomery. You got Jones ahead. You got Shelby off the board. Uh, that was, you just asked me a minute ago, is there some kind of Hail Mary scenario? It involved massive numbers here. More share of the vote in Shelby dropped since the last time I talked to you. And Doug Jones has just tweeted, thank you, Alabama. And so that is the first uh, word of acceptance uh, from Doug Jones tonight of what looks like his his victory speech begins with a tweet tonight. Thank you, Alabama. Just to repeat, NBC News has not yet called the race in Alabama. Uh, it is true that other news organizations have. It is true that uh, major uh, political uh, operations of Republican operations in Washington are already putting out press releases uh, saying that Steve Bannon lost this race uh, for the Republicans. And, uh, and, and Rachel, we, we are sure close to getting a call on this. Yeah, can uh, to, to that point, in terms of what Steve is describing about the number that remains to come in, if you look at the numbers in the outstanding counties where we still got outstanding vote, and you compare them to how Roy Moore did when he won a squeaker of a race for the Alabama State Supreme Court five years ago in 2012, he is dramatically more... He's, pretty dramatically underperforming his own performance in that squeaker of a race in all of those counties where vote remains. From Jefferson County, he's gone from 37% of the vote to 29%. Madison County, has gone from 48% to 40%. Mobile, he's gone from 47% to 42%. Montgomery, he's gone down from 29% to 27%. I mean, he's underperforming himself in a race he won very narrowly five years ago from a perspective where he needs to make up thousands of votes in order to get over the finish line. So mathematically, I mean, our, we should mention that our election folks who call these things are totally separate from our editorial and we're not negotiating with them about this. But it's hard to understand mathematically where any vote might come in that could get Roy Moore in range. And NBC News is now calling Doug Jones the apparent winner in this special Senate election in Alabama. That's NBC's call. 
at this hour, uh, 13 minutes before 11, the apparent winner in Alabama. And uh, uh, Rachel, we can expect the congratulatory presidential tweet any moment. Yes, I'm sure. And the, and, the, and the peace be with you. And we are all Americans first. And we look forward to reaching across party lines. It's going to be nice when I wake up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we shall see, I mean, how the president reacts to this. Obviously, this is a loss for the president because he came out so overtly uh, for Roy Moore. It would have been a loss for the president, too, had Roy Moore been on his way to Washington. Yeah. Just a loss of a different kind. Steve Kornacki, we now have an apparent winner. Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering when that was going to happen, yeah. so there you go. Uh, look, we were talking for a week or two in the run-up to this thing about what the formula would be if a Democrat's actually going to win a Senate race in Alabama. And let me just remind you what those keys were. Number one, we said not only does Jones, the Democrat, need to get the level of support that Barack Obama got from black voters, and the exit poll tells us he got exactly that same level of support, 95% for Obama among black voters and 95% for Jones among black voters. But more importantly, he needed to get that term. Out. And we tracked this throughout the night. The heavily black counties that make up this part of the state, in one county after another, we saw their turnout relative to last year's presidential election much higher than we saw uh, in other parts of the state, white, uh, predominantly white rural counties of the state. So you had black voters who were not engaged in the 2016 campaign getting engaged in this race. And meanwhile, you had white voters. That similar level of engagement in those rural areas wasn't happening. So you got the black support for uh, Dones. You got black turnout for Jones. You had a bit of depressed white turnout in some of these rural areas, especially down here where Roy Moore's people, they were talking about this like a broken record, that this was going to be their area of the state. Well, they, didn't, they got the numbers in terms of the percentages of the vote, but not in terms of the turnout of the vote. And then... That alone was never going to be enough. The other question here was the suburban parts of the state, white college-educated suburbanites. We showed you this was a, a big one. I'll show you again, Lee County. I am still floored by the numbers I'm seeing here because Roy Moore, even nearly losing statewide five years ago, he won this county with 53%. Look at that. He barely got 40% tonight. The same thing happened across the state in Tuscaloosa. Moore got close to 50% here last time out, only 41% tonight. These are college towns, University of Alabama uh, and all. Auburn. So again, you got those defections from college-educated voters, college-educated suburbanites that the Democrats needed. Uh, and again, it's just it's at 10,000 votes right now. We said, look, if there was a campaign that a Democrat could win Alabama, it would have to be this one. And the Democrat has indeed won Alabama. We have another statement for this time from Chuck Schumer from the Democratic Senate leadership. And what's so striking about it is it pretty much borrows a line from what we've been hearing from the Republican Senate leadership. It says. Roy Moore was an awful candidate and never should have gotten to the Senate. Uh, that's, that is Democratic leader Chuck Schumer. And, Rachel, it mirrors what we've been getting out of... Uh, press statements from Republican Senate leadership. Yeah, and it will be it will be interesting to see where the blame falls on the Republican side. Ronna Romney McDaniel is the chair of the National Republican Party. Uh, the National Republican Party withdrew its support for Roy Moore after the allegations about him being sexually abusive toward teenagers um, came out. Uh, and then something happened that made um, the RNC changed its mind on that. We know that her decision, or the RNC's decision to reinvest and get behind Roy Moore again followed Ronald Romney McDaniel being summoned to the White House for a meeting where presumably she was lobbied on this very issue. Um, she then has made apparently uh, remarks at a, a Republican fundraiser where she explained the decision as saying that it was a decision made at the request of the Republican congressional delegation from Alabama whereupon the senior senator from Alabama, Richard Shelby, said, oh no it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. He gave us a statement last night for my show that he had nothing to do with the RNC decision and they should not be characterizing it that way. The RNC is going to have to answer for why it made this decision and on whose advice, who pulled the trigger here. Um, and, you know, if they're not willing to admit why they did it or who did it, that would suggest they're not too proud of this decision. Looks like uh, Jones family taking the stage there in Alabama. I want to go to Gene Robinson, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for The Washington Post and son of the South. Uh, Gene, <laughs> what did you see happen here? tonight 
Well, I saw there, there are three big losers tonight, Lawrence. Of course, Roy Moore. Um, but the other two are Steve Bannon and Donald Trump. Um, uh, and I, th I think that really should be the headline tonight. I mean, how do you elect a Democratic senator in Alabama in 2017? Well, uh, you get the Republicans to nominate a candidate who was an accused pedophile. And even before he was an accused pedophile, uh, was, um, uh, was unpopular among many Republicans in the state. Was a terrible candidate. Uh, and uh, so thanks, Steve Bannon, for um, insisting on Roy Moore as the Republican standard bearer for this seat. Uh, thanks, Donald Trump, for supporting him. They are really huge losers tonight. Uh, and, uh, and it is a setback, I think, for Trumpism. Uh, we're joined now by Brian Williams. Brian, that's a historic night, confetti on a Democratic stage in Alabama. No one uh, earlier today, shall we say, in the <coughs> politics business could have uh, would have given you a good bet on this outcome tonight. But as we've been watching the drama of Steve Kornacki, who was running <laughs> out of red-based county numbers uh, as it got down to it. And uh, Lawrence, it's been harrowing television to watch and uh, uh, concur with everything said thus far tonight. I would just remind everybody of the context of today. Think about the president's uh, travel. Via, uh, via Twitter. Think about how it feels to be uh, Kirsten Gillibrand of the state of New York tonight. Um, all of it kind of coming together. This is going to be the period at the end of the sentence. A lot of the people at Jones headquarters, as you can see, plainly evident, did not think they'd be at the winning headquarters tonight. Brian, I'm going to be handing this over to you in a moment as Doug Jones uh, speaks. I'm sure we will transition into your hour, the 11th hour. Uh, but, but Brian, uh, this is a, a return, uh, actually, to uh, what used to be the norm in Alabama. There were two Democratic senators from Alabama in Bill Clinton's first year as president. I know you remember the uh, figure that Howell Heflin yes. uh, cut in the U.S. Senate. Oh, and yes. if, if you get a few years on you, uh, <laughs> everything comes back again. And you remember the last time things looked like this. Uh, but this is new politics for a new era. I guess we can't uh, draw any broader conclusions. We have to resist the media temptation uh, uh, to do that. Uh, but for the moment, as you mentioned, Democrats have uh, uh, won a crowning victory tonight in Alabama. Jerry Reed, uh, we're going to find out what incumbency can do for a Democrat running for what would be re-election on a Senate race in Alabama. Yeah, I had a Republican strategist friend who's from the South um, say to me, you know, whichever of these guys wins is going to have a tough time in 2020 when you have a fully robust turnout among the electorate because Roy Moore's really not that popular, and Doug Jones obviously is a Democrat. But, you know, Doug Jones has a real opportunity here. If he can deliver on the hope that you see in that screen tonight, where you've got a coalition of young white voters, um, he got enough margin out of particularly white women voters, where he got in the 40s, which is what you need to get, younger voters, collegiate voters, and African-American voters. If he can deliver on that hope and deliver real, you know, change um, and, and remain as sort of scrupulously moderate uh, as he's been throughout this campaign. I mean, this guy's pro-choice. Think about that for a minute. This is an openly pro-choice Democrat who is taking a victory lap in Alabama. If he can deliver, I don't know. I wouldn't count him out in 2020. Let's listen to the message he delivers to Alabama in his victory tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my. Folks, I got to tell you, I think that I have been waiting all my life and now I just don't know what the hell to say. Let me, if you will indulge me just a moment. Well, no, <laughs> well, let's just get sworn in first before we... Folks, I, I, I'm overwhelmed, but I, I want to... Let me, let me first make a couple of kind of brief comments. You know, I have said throughout this campaign that I thought that December 12th was going to be a historic day. But, but I got to tell you, and you know where I'm headed, December 12th has always been a historic day for the Jones family. This is, as you know, Mine and Louise's 25th wedding anniversary. My running mate, my partner. I could not, I 
could not have done this without her. The love, support, the encouragement. Earlier in the evening when she just kind of kicked me in the rear end when I was down. Um, so this has been a wonderful night. I've got to thank my family. I've got my wonderful sons, Carson, Christopher, my daughter, Courtney, my beautiful granddaughters, her son-in-law, Rip, all these friends back here, U.S. Attorney buddies, my mom who can make it here. My dad, who's here with us in spirit, who's too ill, and unfortunately, my, my sister, Terry, and her husband, Scott, Terry Savage, and Scott Savage. Hey, girls, thank you, thank you. She couldn't make it either. I, I am truly overwhelmed. I am truly, truly overwhelmed. But you know, folks, and you have all heard me say this at one point or another in this campaign. I have always believed that the people of Alabama had more in common than to divide us. We have, we have shown not just around the state of Alabama, but we have shown the country the way that we can be unified. We have spent so many hours. I have got so many people that I can thank, but I will tell you just very quickly. There are three people that I want to acknowledge tonight because if it wasn't for them, we would not be here. They're the folks that sat me down in early May and said, Doug, you can do this, and they showed me the way. And I want to make sure that everyone in this room, and we had an incredible staff. It started with a small group of folks. Jess and Wade and Trey and Garrett. But the three people I need to acknowledge before I go any further. I have the greatest political consultant in the world in Joe Trippy. I know you're tired of seeing my ads, but they were all Joe's work and he, sh he showed me the way. Doug Turner, who've been friends for so long showed me the numbers. And then the one that I call the Yoda of the campaign, Giles Perkins. Giles, Giles has had his own issues to deal with over the summer, but this campaign and what he has done is whenever the history is written about Alabama politics, remember those names, Giles Perkins, Doug Turner, and Joe Trippi. There are so many, there are too many people here. I want to just say this. Folks, we have come so far. We have come so far and the people of Alabama has, have spoken. They have said we... They have said to, to each other that this, I have said from the very beginning, this campaign has never been about me. It's never been about Roy Moore. It has been about every one of you, every one of you and your sons and daughters. It's, it's all of those volunteers that knocked on 300,000 doors. It's, it's the volunteers who made 1.2 million phone calls around the state. It's those volunteers to make sure that we knew it was every community. You know, I keep hearing about the different uh, uh, communities in this state, the African-American community. Thank you. We've had that same excitement. At the end of the day, this, this entire race has been about dignity and respect.
This, this campaign, this campaign has been about the rule of law. This can This campaign has been about common courtesy and decency and making sure everyone in this state, regardless of which zip code you live in, is going to get a fair shake in life. And let me, let me just say this, folks, to all of those, all of my future colleagues in Washington, to all <laughs> I've had such wonderful help, but I want to make sure, in all seriousness, there are important issues facing this country. There are important issues of health care and jobs and the economy. And I, want to, I would like, as everyone in, this, in the entire probably free world knows right now, we've tried to make sure that this campaign was about finding common ground and reaching across and actually getting things done for the people. So I, I, have, a, I have a challenge. I have this challenge to my future colleagues in Washington. Don't wait on me. Take this election from the great state of Alabama. Let me finish. Take this election. Take this election where the people of Alabama said, we want to get something done. We want you to find common ground. We want you to talk. Take this opportunity in, in light of this election and go ahead and fund that SHIP program before I get up there. Put it aside and let's do it for those million kids and 150,000 here in Birmingham, Alabama. I am not going to talk too much longer. It's been a long night. It's been a long campaign. But let me, no, let me, let me just say, let me, I, I know I've forgotten so much. I've forgotten so much. There's so many thank yous and how we feel. This vote, this vote, I've said it before. Alabama has been at a crossroads. We have been at crossroads in the past. Yes. And unfortunately, we have usually taken the wrong fork. Right. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, you took the right road. That's exactly USA. USA. level. Let me tell you, and I, I, I said this at the top, and I, I, I do mean this. It seems, I, I want to thank each of you for helping me feel, fulfill a lifelong dream of, of serving in the United States Senate that started out with my mentor, Howell Heflin, and ever since then, that has been my dream. Thank you for that. At the end of the so as, as, as we approach this history, as we approach this crossroads, we have work to do. We have work to do in this state to, to build those bridges within this state, to reach across with those that didn't vote for us to try to find that common ground. I'm pledging to do that tonight, but I will tell you, tonight is a night for rejoicing because as Dr. King said, as Dr. King liked to quote, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Tonight, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, tonight in this time, in this place, you helped bend that moral arc a little closer to that justice, and you did it. That moral arc, not only was it bent more, not only was its aim truer, but you sent it right through the heart of the great state of Alabama in doing so. Thank you all. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, and God bless you. And God bless the great state of Alabama and the United States of America. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. 
and what the president tweet. The tweet tonight, I don't think really was the president's tweet. It's not what he really feels. It did seem sort of civilized. It's not, yeah, it's not what he really felt about yeah, this election. Yeah. What happened? What what I'm hearing inside the White House is that they, he ain't too happy. Who's he blaming? Um, he, well, I think he's bl he's blaming Mitch McConnell. So that's going to come. It's going he's blaming uh, the establishment folks on the Hill. That then pivots. How do they then respond? I think you've already seen the first salvo from McConnell who said to to the uh, senator senator elect, we are looking forward to welcome you to the Senate to work with us in the Republican caucus. Now, why is that important? One, it's, yeah, we know we're now 49, 51. But also he knows uh, uh, Jones's backyard. And if Jones has any desire to hold that seat after 2020, he's, gotta give. he's gonna have Who's to Who's gonna give, give him the wiggle room? And he's gonna Will get Chuck the Schumer let him vote a couple of times Republican? If, if, yeah, absolutely, I think. Uh, okay, let me, go, let me go to Beth Clayton. Your thoughts on this, Beth? We haven't had you on, but I wanna know what you know because you know probably a lot more than me. What surprised you? Because the polls were back and forth. We had one 10 points for uh, for Jones the other day, but that was an in-person poll. I, I think the robocalls are getting better. And then the other one going nine points the other way uh, for Jones. Uh, I'm back. I'm, I'm sorry, back for uh, more. And then we had four or so out of the last five before that who were all for uh, for more. So what what are we, what did we learn? The inability of polls to poll, or what? What are we at here? Well, you know, I don't trust the polls ever since we saw what happened in 2016 when they were telling us that Hillary had it in the bag. But what I do trust are Alabama values, and the people of Alabama showed tonight that we will not tolerate this sort of nonsense representing our voices in the United States Senate. And we showed up, and we spoke up, and we made sure that America knows that we mean business when it comes to the Trump agenda. And if we can fight him right here in his own home field advantage, we will fight him in every single state where he thinks he can win. How much has the atmosphere of Harvey Weinstein and everything else that's come since the major n network people, the people we know, Matt and everybody else and Charlie Rose, and of course the charges against the Republican candidate down there, which have been so vocal and so credible. How much did that sort of national envelope that this thing came in affect the voting in Alabama? You know, I think it made a huge difference because this kind of thing resonates with women. When you look at women across Alabama or in any corner of the United States, We've all been in a situation where a man didn't treat us right, and we know that feeling, and we know how it feels to not be believed. And we showed up and we said, we're not going to tolerate it. And it helps that looking across the country, women were beginning to be believed in all corners of, of America, and they felt confident coming out here in Alabama where we frankly don't have a lot of room to, to wiggle here. And so we women came out and we said no more. And frankly, no more. We deserve better than this. Yeah, it was a giant chorus. It has been and will be. We're joined right now on the phone by Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. Uh, Senator, thank you for joining us. You are a big uh, national Democrat. If you don't know it yet, you're one of the leaders of your party. And uh, I'm wondering, what's this mean to you tonight? Well, Chris, uh, the sun's going to be shining tomorrow morning because the people of Alabama have spoken. They rejected the divisiveness. And you had in Doug Jones a candidate who is a moderate, but he brought people together. His whole background as a prosecutor and taking on that case, those four little girls killed in that church decades yeah. before. He's a man of redemption, and today he brought redemption uh, right. and will bring redemption to Washington. What does it feel like as a progressive to look at a guy coming in who probably couldn't get a reelected down there if he, if he voted entirely progressive? Will he get some, to use your phrase, wiggle room to be able to vote moderate on enough issues to convince the voters of Alabama he's representative of the state? You know, we've got a party uh, right now in the Senate that goes from Bernie Sanders to Joe Manchin. And certainly Joe Manchin of West Virginia is voting a lot different than some of the people from New York and California. Um, so I don't see that as much as the issue as what's right in front of us right now. Uh, we've got yeah. this tax bill. You know, the, the laws take effect. Uh, the Alabama laws uh, give it a few weeks to be certified. So I would hope uh, that they are having trouble with that tax bill now. They should hold it off here. You've got the vast majority of Americans against this tax bill. You've got a conservative state like Alabama, just like Virginia just did, saying we don't like this kind of politics. We don't like of the cutting of Medicaid and Medicare and some of what we're hearing from the Republican Party. Let's go back to the drawing board again. Senator, hold on there. I want to bring in Tom Perez, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Senator, thank I mean, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for coming on. Does this hearten your chances to take the Senate next year? Because you're now within a vote or two, two votes now of winning the thing. It takes you 51 to control the thing. Do you think you got a shot now for 2018 to win the Senate? Absolutely, Chris. Uh, you look at 
uh, Nevada, you look at Arizona, you look at Tennessee, you look at other opportunities out there. And what I've learned from the last 12 months is Democrats can win virtually anywhere. If we lead with our values, if we have candidates like Doug Jones and what we saw tonight was this wasn't about right versus left. This was about right versus wrong. This was about voters in Alabama who put country over party. And uh, I think there are opportunities everywhere. Uh, Tennessee is going to be competitive. And so uh, I'm, I'm very uh, bullish moving forward because tonight was a victory for decency. Uh, a year ago, uh, Trump won by 28 points. And so in one year, you see a 30-point swing uh, because they're just so overreaching. Uh, and, and Senator Klobuchar mentioned the tax bill. They had to slow that down and actually uh, listen to their constituents. Uh, they, they continue to overreach at their political peril. Talking about overreaching, uh, your candidate down here won, and I'm actually very happy about it, of course, but uh, Doug uh, Jones was, a, was pretty far out there in the beginning on abortion rights, saying it was okay with him to be pro-choice right to the end of term, and he, then he pulled that back. Is there going to be a, a, enough flexibility in the Democratic Party to allow people to take a, you know, a Roe v. Wade position, of course, but to not be all the way with this abortion to the end approach that he took in the beginning, which really much jeopardized, I believe, his candidacy? Well, I've known Doug for almost 20 years. Uh, we worked in the Clinton Justice Department together. And what I love about Doug is uh, he is an independent voice, uh, and he always will be. And I'm confident there are going to be times when uh, Doug does and says things that uh, other Democrats agree with, and I'm confident there are going to be times that uh, he says things that we may not agree with. And I know that his North Star is always going to be uh, what works best for Alabamans. That's why he was elected tonight because he talked about the issues that keep people up at night. He talked about uh, good jobs. He talked about his father, the steel worker, and how he wants to make sure that uh, people have a better life uh, in the future. He talked about education. He talked about children's health insurance. Right. He talked about uh, you know, preserving access to health care. Uh, that's what Doug is about. Hashtag uh, kitchen table. That's what he yeah, talked well, that about. Sounds and, like a win you know, to me. Moore was fighting the culture wars, and, and Doug is going to fight for ordinary Alabamians. You're singing my song, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. You're singing my song. Let me go back to, uh, the, thank you for joining us by phone, uh, the Chairman of the Democratic Party, Tom Perez. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, I just want to, are you still on? I sure am. Let me ask you about this victory. And you remember this, Senator. You lost, we all lost, I think, your, your fellow Senator Al Franken the other, other week. And we'll be thinking about that one for, for years, I think, and what that was all about and the rightness and the, well, perhaps the unfairness of, of it in certain ways and the fairness of it in another way. Let me ask you about, uh, about winning the Senate majority. Why is it important for the Democrats to have 51 Democratic senators rather than 49? What are the stakes? <laughs> Well, it's pretty obvious when you look at, one, the court and some of the uh, judges uh, that this president has been putting on. You look at, two, um, the economic plans. Uh, repeatedly, they've been trying to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act instead of doing some sensible fixes that we need for America. And then this tax bill, which is really um, a big transfer of wealth and a huge debt that would be accumulated on the backs of the middle class. And we want to do reasonable things. Eighteen of us stood up and said we want to work with you on tax reform. We'll bring down business taxes. But they're not coming to the table, and they're running up the table. And I think with this victory, uh, not only in Alabama, but those victories that we saw in New Jersey and Virginia, so that the American people, particularly suburban voters, we see huge turnout with African-American voters, huge turnout with young people, uh, that they're just saying we want to take this country in another way, and that way is decency and respect. And in each case, the divisive politics have been rejected. Do you think we'd be better off if this president simply resigned after all this concern about his behavior in the past and his current comments and turned it over to Vice President uh, Pence? Would we be better off? You know what? Tough I want question, to see but I love an answer from you. The, I was, I was, did not want to see this president go in place. I favor these investigations that people are talking about, and certainly the investigation we're seeing on Russia. And that's the only way we're going to be able to see a change, is if um, the facts come out and there is, in fact, um, a reason uh, through Congress um, for uh, some kind of proceeding. And right now, that's what we have to let happen. But at the same time, we cannot let go. And this is the message we heard from Alabama and Virginia, this economic message of people that want us to simply focus on these bread and butter issues 
and to stand up for them every step of the way. Thank you. Okay, it's great Thank having you on Senator Amy Klobuchar on the phone. In a conversation with Eugene Robinson last on Hardball, I made this prediction about tonight's race. I'm beginning to think maybe it's a, a, a slight victory for, um, for Jones. We'll see. Wow. Thank you, Eugene Robinson. I know I'll be held to that. <laughs> and I'll hold myself to that. Michael, what do you think? No, let's go, let's go back to uh, Joy Reid on this. Joy, I like being right, yes. and I'm often right. I, I uh, thought a slight victory is about the way you might describe this tonight. In other words, I nailed it. So well, let's go on. Uh, do you think 19 or 20, I'm, I'm getting old, 2017 and 2016 are different. 2016 was a big shock to our system. On a lot of things social as well as economic issues that led yeah. a lot of those people to vote for Trump, they were just ticked off at the establishments of both parties. Do you think the wheel's turning, or is it too early to see whether it's turning for let's start with 18 is 17 is 18 going to be more like 17 and is that enough is that enough just these two big three victories new jersey virginia and certainly this is the most important one most shocking one in the other direction in the progressive direction yeah. or mo moderate direction in alabama does this mean your party's in good the democrats are in good shape to hold on in indiana to hold on in west virginia you know hold on in in missouri win in uh, nevada places where you could actually see a, a significant democratic majority coming out of next year's election i can see it yeah I, 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 go ahead i think the historic trends are in the democrats direction in part because when a party has the white house a lot of their voters, which whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, become complacent and satisfied. You saw that with Obama voters who got that big win in 2008 and then largely stayed home and walked away in 2010 thinking, well, my job is done because yeah. Obama attracted a lot of marginally attached voters who don't typically vote who came out specifically for him. Trump did the same thing. He brought out a lot of marginally attached white voters who got what they wanted already in 2016 and weren't going to be as motivated when he himself was not on the ballot. It's sort of the upside down version of the Obama voter. It's the same idea. And so when you had Roy Moore, who also, let's face it, Chris, there was a lot of just plain disgust. Resistance is real, particularly among women and people of color. They want this changed back. This Trump era is, 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 is agonizing and excruciating for Democrats, for progressives, for people of color. They're energized. And I think what you're going to see in 2018 is the same thing. You have a lot of satisfied Republicans who are happy with Trump, but he won't be on the ballot. And so he can't yeah. compel them to vote when it's not Trump's name that's actually on that ballot. He's got to try to transfer that to Republicans. But who's mm. he fighting with? Republicans. So there's really no way Donald Trump okay. can really help his party. I think Democrats are in really Joy good shape, good candidates, and a mm. motivated base. Okay, I'm out of time, but I want to ask Michael, and is that once people like to take one good punch to the gut at the establishment, is that satisfying enough for them to say, I'll go back to my regular voting pattern? We'll see. I think that's that's typically what we've seen in the past, and it could very well be the same next year. But I'd be a little bit cautious and put the brakes on a little bit of what Joy's talking about, uh, simply because the Democrats have 25 seats up, a big number of those in red states next year. So they're going to have to defend yeah. uh, in Republican territory, uh, which may not necessarily Necessarily go like it did tonight in Alabama but the seeds are there and I think this is a big lesson for Republicans to take away from tonight that it does matter who you lie down with because when you get up with fleas baby all you're gonna do is scratch you ain't gonna win much <laughs> you're not winning much you're just gonna itch so lie down think with about that you know, fleas did, yeah. your, did your grandpa Finnegan tell you that one Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sorry that's Joe I'm Biden's grandpa Finnegan <laughs> anyway right. thank you Joy Reid I heard from a progressive then I heard from a moderate and it's very good Beth Clayton more time next time thank Thank you very much for coming on. Coming up, the stunning victory tonight by Doug Jones is giving Democrats visions of big things to come. We've been talking about that already. If they can win in Alabama. Who, where can't they win? We've got a big chance to take control of the Senate. I just said that. I'm ahead of this teleprompter. We're coming back with much more on the big night in American pot. What a celebration this is going to be. Doug Jones, this guy clawed his way to the top. He's the guy that took on the Klan, then he took on Roy Moore. He won both times. Good for America. And this is a specialism hardball where the action is. Welcome back to this special edition, I would say celebratory edition of Hardball. Doug Jones will be the first Democratic senator from the state of Alabama since Hal Heflin won as a Democrat in 1990, which is, I believe, 27 years ago. For a closer look at how Jones did it, we're joined by Steve Kornacki, who knows all things. Steve, I do love the fact that I'm learning about the geography of Alabama. There is, like in most states, there's always a Montgomery County for some reason. Every time we go somewhere, there's a Montgomery County, and it tends to be decisive. <laughs> 
take, anyway, you take over. Yeah, hey, Montgomery's, one, well, we'll start with Montgomery County, and let's start with the counties around Montgomery County. Two keys tonight for Jones pulling off this victory. One is this sort of batch of counties here, the blue ones. That's Montgomery right there, the biggest of the bunch. A lot of these, though, are rural. These are also heavily black counties. And the key here wasn't just that these were votes for Jones generally. The key here was turnout. If you looked at where the turnout was in this state in the 2016 presidential election, the drop-off in these counties was a lot less. The drop-off was a lot less than you saw in these <laughs> rural areas, these heavily white rural areas. So that's one thing. Black turnout in these areas was very strong. Something else in this result, <laughs> it, it gave Jones the win, and I think ought to worry Republicans nationally, too. It's a continuation a bit of a trend we've been seeing in this Trump era of the Republican struggles in traditionally Republican suburbs. So let me start right here in Shelby County, which is right outside Birmingham. Now, Shelby County is traditionally a Republican bastion. It is also, of all the counties in Alabama, it has the highest concentration of four-year college graduates. So this is a place where Mitt Romney got almost 80 percent of the vote in 2012, where Donald Trump got 73 percent of the vote uh, last year in 2016. Roy Moore tonight, yeah, he wins it. This is catastrophic for a Republican in this kind of county. 56% of the vote. That's a huge drop from what Republicans tend to expect here. And again, these are the kinds of voters, those white, college-educated suburbanites that the Jones campaign thought they could make inroads with. Take a look up here. Here's another one. Madison County. Every state's got a Madison County, too. Sometimes it feels like Huntsville, the aerospace industry. This is number two in all the counties in Alabama in terms of the, the, the percentage that have four-year college degrees, a lot of engineering degrees up here. Again, this is a place that Donald Trump won last year with 55 percent, a place Mitt Romney took 60 percent uh, when he ran in 2012. Today, Roy Moore only able to get 40 percent. So it's it's the real discomfort with Roy Moore that we saw in these suburbs. Again, these are terrible numbers for Republicans to be racking up in these places. And you look, we think of that Virginia gubernatorial race a few weeks ago, those suburbs outside Washington, D.C., uh, a lot of sort of common characteristics there in terms of the types of voters uh, yeah. that we're talking about. That could have have implications uh, in 2018. Great report. Did you sense anything in the last week or two? Did you sense watching this dynamically that this was going gradually to uh, to to Jones? Yeah, I mean, look, we didn't see mass defections from Republican leaders in this. We saw the president of the United States decide, in fact, at the last minute to get involved in this race. But we did see Shelby. I thought Senator Richard Shelby was a was yeah. a, a good sort of bellwether here. His refusal to make that endorsement, you know, I, I that's what I was thinking of when I saw the turnout figures in this part of the state. When I saw the turnout figures, that speaks to a Republican base. It's not that necessarily there that they. They were going to go vote for Jones. It was more that maybe they just weren't going to vote. You know, that reminds me, Steve, uh, of what John Warner did in, in Virginia a couple of years ago, a couple of cycles ago. Allie North, yeah. He just said, I will not vote for this guy, Ali North, and it really took, put the stink on the guy. Anyway, thank you so much, Steve. By the way, here's a look back at how you reported the drama of tonight. Let's watch <laughs> you in action. It's skeletal, it's sketchy, it's early. You see only about 25,000 votes. Jones out to the early lead. I mean, it just all depends where it's coming from. You can see here about a quarter of the vote in. With the counted total right now, Moore is leading. But big caution here, the biggest county in the state, Jefferson County, that's where Birmingham is. It only started to come in there. So basically, let's forget that 55-44 you're seeing a turnout advantage, an enthusiasm advantage in the heavily black areas of the state. So that is a key thing that's happening for Jones. And by the way, the margin now down to 13,000. The basic ingredients are there. This is a narrow race. It's a question of is it going to be just enough or is it going to be just short for Democrats? But again, this is sort of if they're ever going to win one, Lawrence, probably be in the next hour or two. Half the vote to come in out of Mobile where Jones's lead is over is a 10,000 votes, over 10,000 votes right now. Still half the vote to come. And again, he's within 3,000 statewide. Take a look up here in Madison. You still have 15 percent to come in. He's got a 17 point lead right now. He's going to get more votes out of here, more votes out of here, more margin out of here. And he's within 3,000 statewide. You know, Karnacki outdoes me in speed and activity. You are amazing. We cut your, he cut the dynamism of tonight's reporting, but it's great to watch the progression. Thank you so much tonight, Steve Karnacki, for this dynamic display of greatness. Hey, for more, I'm joined who? by...
Who doesn't Jay. love an election night? Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I, I do, too. I love the sound of that music we play. Anyway, thank you. Coming on right now is John Brabender, of course, Republican strategist, and Karine Jean-Pierre, senior advisor for MoveOn.org. I'll give you a chance to uh, yuck it up. Go ahead. <laughs> this is a Karine. great night, a great night for Democrats. As we talk, as you guys have been talking about Virginia, we've Democrats have done well the last two elections with Virginia and now Alabama, which is a great boost for Democrats going in 2018. But as Steve was saying, the reason why Democrats won tonight in Alabama is because of turnout. And the only way you have turnout is you have to have a large, strong operation, grassroots operation on the ground, okay. and you have to have a great candidate. And Doug Jones was Are you going to let Doug Jones be a moderate? <laughs> yes or no? Are you guys going to push him I, to the left? I think he should, I think he should um, reject uh, Donald Trump's policies, which are horrible. No, I'm asking, are you guys on the, on the left going to let him be you know, a moderate? We're, we're going we're to push him to be a progressive. To be, to in, 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 in Alabama? I, I think he. I think he should be. I think. I think. You think. You think a, prog a true progressive can win re-election in Alabama? I think if you if you stand on the right side of history. No, no. You stand you're, for you the wanted right to have a hundred percent ADA voting record. I think he. Sh I think he should write. I think he should vote with Democrats on and against all the. All the vote Republicans vote re consistently with Democrats. I think so. Yes. Why not? Yeah, the Republicans why not? Why not? love hearing this. But it's, no, but I really it's, think that's a no, mistake. If he could do no. that all the way till but 2020, here's the thing. that but, would but be great. But we're not. But this is not. Go ahead, Respond to that. This is not normal times. This is not. Uh, times go ahead. what Republicans are look, trying to look, do. Look. Go first, first, I'm going to congratulate Doug Jones. I mean, he, he deserves to be congratulated by our entire party, and I'm not going to... But let's be honest what this race really was. It was a referendum on Roy Moore. Misbehavior. I mean, yeah, think about it. I mean, this guy was under multiple allegations for sexual... Credible. Senator Shelby greatly out-Trumps, no pun intended, the president and Bannon in saying what he was going to do. If you look at the re election results, what happened is a lot of Republicans did stay home, yeah. and the percent of Republican votes that the Republican got was much less than the percent of Democrat votes the Democrat got. And so let, let, this, was, this was really nothing to do with Doug Jones. This was everything to do with people said, and even, you know, if it's Mitch McConnell, or anybody else, they basically said we'd rather go with not supporting somebody who we don't want to defend their character once he's here, even if it means we're going to lose one Senate seat. And if the Republicans really wanted to unify and win this seat, they could have. They didn't. They felt that he... He would have been the gift. Roy Moore would have been the gift for you that gives Chris, all year round. Chris, can I push back for one second here? Because during the primary, the Republican primary, while they were having their runoff, there were two there were two general election polls that came out that had Doug Jones being being very close in beating both Luther Strange and also Roy okay, Moore. So it was competitive. These, he, it was competitive before. That was before. So before are you the telling pedophilia. me you think Doug Jones pedophilia. would have won if these I'm allegations not, I'm, would I'm not have come out? I'm saying that Doug Jones was a great candidate because he made this competitive. Even before the allegations, you think Doug I'm Jones saying, could have won if these allegations. That's didn't not come no. Out. You're saying that Doug Jones didn't matter as a candidate. I'm saying that okay. is not true. That he was he made this election competitive even before the 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 pedophile thing, the stuff came out. Yeah, the it's, it's the same out. reason that's Donald Trump saying. could not have won I, without Hillary Here's what I, I will agree with you on this: that the Me, Me Too movement played a strong role in this. Absolutely, they were winners in all of this as well. Do you think uh, Do you think Doug Jones can survive as a, as a senator down there more than this one half term? Not, not if he acts like a Democrat, yeah. not if he votes that way. If he wants to sort of, he can even keep the deregistration, but he has to prove to Alabamians that he is going to act yeah, like their, Joe, their values. Is Joe the model? Um, yeah, but Joe's different. Do you remember, Joe is a governor. People got to know him personally, yeah, but he still has a tough re-election. I know he does. So he's been, he's, the, been, he's been voting with Democrats. Do you really mean it? A well, progressive Joe senator been, can get elected. He's been voting with Democrats. Okay, this we'll, whole uh, we'll see. Year. Let me ask you. Thank you. I disagree <laughs> with you, but that's fair enough. Well, you disagree with me. That's fine. <laughs> anyway, thank you, John Brabender. Thank you, Kareem Jean Pierre. Up next, after tonight's victory in Alabama, what does this mean for the Democratic Party going forward? And how good are things looking for 2018? I think they're looking good if the Democrats are smart. You're watching Hardball, a special edition of Hardball.
Big night for the Democrats. Welcome back to this special. There's some hardball. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will not have to deal with the problem of Roy Moore joining Republicans in the Senate. There'll be no Jonah up on that ship anymore. And he will have to contend with uh, the new math, however. The Doug Jones victory shrinks the Republicans' already thin or slim majority down to a single seat. Look at it there. That's 49 Democrats, 51, effectively 49 Democrats and 51 Republicans. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader, welcomed his newest colleague in his statement writing, well, come on, Chuck, you could have stayed up. Doug Jones will be an outstanding senator who will represent Alabama well. He was a great candidate and will be an even better senator. Roy Moore was an awful candidate and never should have gotten to the Senate. But make no mistake about it, just like in Virginia, Democrats are energized, focused on the middle class and those struggling to get there. And things are looking better and better for 2018. For more on what's next, by the way, this is me talking now. What's next? I'm bringing in the expert Larry Sabato down at UVA, director of the Center for Politics down here at University of Virginia, and Charlie Cook, editor and publisher of the great Cook Political Report. First, I want to talk with Larry Sabato. Virginia was a pretty powerful message uh, a couple of weeks back, but this one, Alabama has become part of the new solid South, Republican, and it's not solid, not when it comes to Roy Moore. Oh, look, this this is much bigger than Virginia, and I love Virginia, and I think it was a very strong signal. But to have a, a ruby red state like Alabama with Doug, uh, with um, President Trump carrying it by 28 percentage points and then managing to lose a Senate seat, even by a small margin, it, it really suggests what could be coming in 2018, even with Roy Moore being a horrible candidate. Don't forget, uh, Donald Trump struck out twice in Alabama, once in the primary and then in the special general election. So it suggests to me, and I think to a lot of people, that he is not going to have a lot of pull in 2018. And what pull he has, especially in competitive states, is going to be negative for the Republicans. Thank you. That, thank you for saying that. First of all, the women, pro-choice single women in Northern Virginia, we know that story. I've grown Grown up with it the last 50 years around here, around Washington, pro-choice Republican or Democratic women in Northern Virginia vote Democrat because they're pro pro-choice. I want to talk to you about the African American vote, which is apparently half of the winner's vote tonight was African American. What is it the sense I get anecdotally with people who are African American, not just in this business of commentary, political I sense a real sense this guy. Has, is demoting us as citizens. He's denigrating us. He's treating us as lower than, maybe not lower than human, but really down there on the pecking order of who matters. He seems to send that message in a very personal way to people. And you get it in their faces, no. the looks they have when they talk about him. It's profound. And I wonder if that could just stir something that we haven't seen in a while, a larger than white, if you will, turn out among African Americans. They're just going to care more about these elections coming up. It happened well, in Philly, by the way, because I know what I'm talking about, because we had Frank Rizzo as mayor. The African-Americans outvoted the, the white people because they couldn't stand that mayor because he seemed anti-black. Sure. Well, uh, I wonder why they feel that way. You know, could it be <laughs> Donald Trump's seen. long history, even before he became I president, know, I know, I of know. racial funny, insensitivity? And I'm being kind. I mean, honestly, it's. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, people get a sense of a president, and I don't think Donald Trump has a clue how most people look at him. And it's now a large majority who look askance at him and are very critical. And every single day, he's stirs the pot three or four times and makes another million enemies. He did it, you know, with uh, Kirsten Gillibrand. It's been pretty tough on this issue of looking out for women in the workplace and the military. You can disagree with her, perhaps her ferocity, but it's an issue that matters to most people. And Trump comes out and calls her basically a slut today. I mean, it was an amazing statement to say she came into my office begging, said, I'll do anything for your money. And he, the, the image he created was just disgusting. That's, that's, it's a fight. Why in the heck would he want to pick that fight? That, why go there? That's Well, every professional woman and every woman who works in an office or a factory or anywhere says, wait a minute, is that what he thinks we do when we ask for a raise? Is that what he thinks is going on? <laughs> really? <laughs> just, just. <laughs> no, it's, it's inexplicable. But that's a perfect yeah, example. example. Yeah, well, that, Charlie, no, what do you think? That's a perfect example. Yeah. yeah of another group that he's just said, I don't respect you. Let but, me ask you about the pure partisanship of this night. Is it, a, is it a harbinger of 2012, of 2018? See, 
I don't think it is. I mean, I think there's a lot of evidence that we're going to see a wave. We're seeing the potential for a huge Democratic wave next year. I think it looks really, Can really, it take really the House bad. And the Senate? Yes, but, the House absolutely, and after this, the Senate is is now really in play. Think. But having said that, I think tonight was really about Roy Moore. If this had been Luther Strange as the Republican nominee or Joe or Jane generic Republican, this show wouldn't be on tonight. I mean that 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 there, there wouldn't be a story. This thing wouldn't have been close. This was about Roy Moore. Was it about Harvey Weinstein and all the environment that's been created since that development? Sure. That uh, yeah, sure. But the thing is that the re problems that Republicans had, you know, it's President Trump's 36, 37 percent job approval rating. It's having a 48, 49, 50 strong disapprove rating. Yeah. It's having the Republican Party identification dropping uh, five points since the since uh, in a year. Yeah. It, it's it's you know it's state legislative seats shifting this year. There's there's an enormous amount of evidence that next year is going to be really ugly, but tonight was about Roy Moore. Yeah. How about the African American vote? Last question to Larry. I want to push that. I am very enthusiastic about African American voting. I mean, it's been depressed. They've been played with, they've been suppressed and all the tricks of voter ID and everything to do to screw them out of voting since literacy tests and everything else and poll taxes. And finally, they had a chance to get out tonight and they spoke loud and clear and beat that guy. I think is this going to rouse them in the future to vote because it matters. Larry. Well, I think it's absolutely going to happen in 2018. I agree with Charlie on the wave that's coming. And don't forget about the governors and state legislatures. I think you're going to see a tremendous turnover to the Democrats there, too, which is going to be critical for the next redistricting coming in 2021. So Donald Trump has got the White House, and I suppose a lot of Republicans are still happy about that. But he's going to cost them tremendously next year in the midterm elections and probably beyond that. You know what? I think the people that like Trump don't like him as much as the people that don't like him don't like him. Anyway, I think we saw that tonight. Charlie Cook, thank you. Larry Sabate, both of you guys are great. I just finished a week and a half ago the Bobby Kennedy book. Yeah. It's really, really good. Thank you. It's uh, really, really, really well, good. Well, there it is, by the way. I didn't tell him to do that, but he wrote the most beautiful. Charlie is an expert on politics. He wrote the most beautiful no. review of my book. And the, I, the best I, book you've done yet. Oh, thank you so much. Up next. It's Christmas time, by the way. Time to go out and get that book. <laughs> tonight's, I don't mind saying it. I don't get many in coming in like that. And anyway, tonight's result in Alabama was a stunning rebuke to President Trump and to Steve Bannon. Well, they continue to hold as much sway in the Republican Party now that they've broken their picks. You're watching Hardball, especially some Hardball. This is greater than Judge Moore, right? It's even greater than the people of Alabama. I know one thing. Nobody can come down here and tell folks in Alabama what to do. There's a special place in hell for Republicans who should know better. You know what they're doing. You know what they're doing when they're trying to shut up uh, President Trump and Judge Moore? They're trying to shut you up. Anyway, that's an outside agitator. That's what he looked like these days. Welcome back to Hardball. That was Steve Bannon going against people who came into Alabama to tell him how to vote as he came into Alabama and told them how to vote, urging Republicans to vote for Roy Moore in that case. Anyway, tonight's loss in Alabama was a rebuke, of course, to that guy, Steve Bannon, but also to President Trump. Let's be honest. And here's the headline from tomorrow's great New York Daily News. <laughs> Screw you and the horse you rode in. Because, of course, the Republican candidate who just lost last night uh, was, of course, the guy who rode in on a horse, uh, Roy Moore, and he was kind of ridiculous doing it. Anyway, here, by the way, the headline also says, Teen Loving Moore loses Alabama race in big blow to Trump. Well, let's bring in <laughs> on that hilarity the hardball roundtable. Annie Lansky, my favorite, chief national correspondent for the Boston Globe, Sophia Nelson, contributor for MSNB or NBC BLK, and Jamal Simmons, the Democratic strategist. So in this order, let me talk about this um, What's it do to, to Bannon and these guys, these friskies, to go out there looking for the most hard right candidate they can find and run them, claiming that unlike the case of Christine O'Donnell, 
and and what's her name uh, Aiken. Out, out there in, uh, in Aiken and Murdoch and the one out in Nevada you know they're actually gonna win turn angles this now they're gonna give us winners they gave us probably the only candidate who could have lost yeah absolutely. a Republican loss right. in um, Alabama which is like hard hot red very hard to do I mean it is a complete and to you can't overstate what a rebuke this is to Steve Bannon who went down there four times to campaign. I mean, he put his stamp on this campaign like nobody else from the outside. I mean, even Donald Trump wouldn't go into the state, but Steve Bannon went there four times. And yeah, it's going to make his life even more difficult here in Washington. I think. And it wasn't exactly an, an away game, Sophia. I mean, it looked like you could, if you can't win in a Republican state, where can you win? I was thinking. It says something different to me, though. The demographics of the country are shifting as such that even in the Red South, I live in Virginia. Virginia, which used to be all red, now it's purple. It's not blue, but you know Before Alabama. You were born, it was all right. Red. Come on, now. What, what Come on was, now. When was it but, all red? But, 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 well, Virginia's Virginia. been red for a long time. It's been a red state. What do you when mean? Was when? 1964 was the last time a, a Democrat had carried it for until Obama. Come on, it's been red. Level. Yeah, and I'm talking about just even in the state. Am I missing something? No, you're not. I, I've known the anyway, guys. let me finish <laughs> my point. Senators for years. In now. Alabama, what happened tonight was I thought Roy Moore would win by a little bit. I think most people did. But what happened was white women and African Americans said no dice, and they made the difference in this election. So demographics count. This Me Too thing is bigger than anybody thinks. Women's stories matter. What has changed in the democracy of, uh, because the, bla the black belt, if you will, the, the cotton south, uh -huh. if you just look at the map, there's always been a very, back in the days it's of the Civil War, there's a, there's a 40 percent, yeah. big percentage is African American. You have younger states. progressive women and young African Americans, more educated, more so that kind of democracy. centrist, yes. That kind of That's what happened. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so here's what I think about Steve Bannon. We know he can't win, or we're starting to get pretty sure he can't win a general election, but he still might be able to swing a pretty big axe in a primary. Yeah. So the question for Republicans, which puts them in a real jam, is can they get past Steve Bannon in a primary enough to be able to be competitive in a general election? Okay, here's just a, let me give you exhibit A. Donnelly could have a tough race in Indiana to get real like these are sure. Democrats yeah. right. run against Crazy Murdoch, one mm -hmm. of the rape candidates. Remember those two? Jesus. Or what do they call them? Rape candidates, yeah. <laughs> and not that they were rapists, but they no, had no, weird no, views no, on the yeah. issue. So so if he gets another Murdoch, he gets back in again. That's right. If, he, if they run as a reasonable Republican, he's gonna have a tough fight in Indiana. And that's gonna happen, I think, all over the country. You're gonna see these Republicans yeah. fighting these primaries where they could get really jammed up by playing ball with Steve Bannon, but they may not be able to have they may not have a choice. That may be the only thing they can do is to dance with Bannon in the primary. Well, well, the news of uh, Doug of Doug uh, Jones's big upset victory tonight won't be the only bad headline greeting President Trump tomorrow morning. In a scathing op-ed, the USA Today editorial board, that's the unsigned major editorial, goes after the president for his sexually suggestive tweet directed at Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. The editorial reads, quote, a president all but call a senator a whore is unfit to clean toilets in Obama's presidential library or to shine George W. Bush's shoes. Yeah. This is the lead editorial Ouch. of USA Today, yeah. which is one of the two or three with the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times national newspaper. Yeah, and you know, this is not a newspaper that's known to be sort of a lefty paper. I mean, I read that and it reads sort of like a lefty screed you might hear at, you know, a Thanksgiving dinner. But instead, this is USA Today, which is, you know, their circulation is the middle of the country. What it's, moved them? You know, it's this Me it's Too gender, movement. It is this this movement of women sharing their stories yeah. changed the whole Alabama race. Without it, Absolutely. Roy Moore would be senator elect right now. If they hadn't uncovered the Washington Post, this okay. stuff, game over. Okay, ask so, me a, to answer me a, a really odd question. It's none of it. It's not a stupid question. It's about a stupid decision. Why did Trump imply very clearly? That Kirsten he Gillibrand, felt like it. that she had come into his office alone and offered her body basically to him to get money from because him. He felt that was like the it. suggestion in what yeah. he said. Yeah. Yes. I, I think Donald Trump has no control when it comes to some of these things. He just sort of blurts out what comes to his mind. I mean, my wife said to me right before I left here, don't mind the tweet he said today. Wait till tomorrow yep, morning. Let's see the tweet right. in the morning because that's when right. Trump puts the stuff out that yep. he really thinks. Yep. But to the Gillibrand tweet, though, I almost feel like Trump just wants to be the center of yep. attention. And for a moment, the attention has been on Alabama. So he likes not us him. talking about him right now. Yeah, and now we're talking about him. He also him. knows it'll get us all riled up, which it has, and he likes it. He feeds on it. He doesn't like women.
can I just say that? He doesn't like women. He's got Explain. mommy issues, Explain. clearly Explain. got Explain mother it. issues. He doesn't like women. Look at how he treats women. Pocahontas. These allegations, 17 women coming out, one alleging something horrific as a minor, that he may have allegedly raped somebody. This is the president of the United States. Wait a minute, who, is, who allegedly the, Remember the young woman that fired, filed a, um, a suit in the, it went in the federal courts and Lisa Bloom was going to represent her and she wouldn't come out because he won the election. She's, yeah. They call her Jane Doe. She, well, nobody let's broaden that a little. I, Besides I that say, horrific stuff. Yeah. I'm saying that's it's horrific. true. It's horrific. It's criminal. It is horrific. It's almost a capital crime. But if, uh, how about this? Making fun of the physical appearance of Fiorina, one of his opponents. Oh, yeah. He wouldn't do that to a guy. No. In this kind of weird, if they're not one of, if they're well, not. Well, he a, said little hands with Marco Rubio. Yeah, or, or, the, or the disabled reporter. Right. Yeah, he, he I think he was. The disabled reporter. He's I just think, mean. I think he's, I think there is sort of a meanness. But, you know, I have to say, I do disagree a bit about women. Because if you do look at his administration and his inner circle, I mean, he does have quite a few women that he listens to. Whether, yeah. honestly, whether it's Hope Hicks oh, or Kellyanne Conway. But it's Conway. the women who stand up to him are the ones that he seems to have a problem with. And here's the last thing, Chris. Who is that? It, Oh, I mean, oh, the uh, Democrats. Elizabeth the Democrats. Warren, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Kirsten Gillibrand. Who would be, be, who would be the best candidate to run against him in terms of standing Sally up face-to-face? Sally, face to face? Sally. Sally Yates. Face-to-face. Face. Is, it, is, it, is it Elizabeth <laughs> Warren? Who would face him down and turn on him? She's like with Hillary, cool. when he's glooming over her during the debate. I mean, looming over like a gorilla behind her. If she, who would turn around and say, what the hell are you doing okay. over here? Who's gonna, I'm waiting for that candidate. That's the one I want. Thank you, Annie Lynch. Thank you, Sophia Nelson. Thank you, Jamal Simmons. We'll be right back with more on this special big-time up said in Alabama. Democrat Doug Jones is the apparent winner in Alabama tonight. There he is. He looks like the real winner, not just the apparent one. Anyway, the face looks real. We'll be right back. <laughs> well, this, I'm happy to say, has been a special edition of Hardball, a midnight edition announcing a big victory. Join me again tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern, a special live edition of The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Starts right now. Good evening, I'm Lawrence O'Donnell, and this is a special election night edition of The Last Word. With 99% of the vote counted now, Democrat Doug Jones has been declared the apparent winner tonight in the Alabama Senate race. It is the first time a Democrat has won a Senate election in Alabama since 1992. Here is some of Doug Jones' historic victory speech. We have come so far, and the people of Alabama has, have spoken. They have said we... They have said to, the, to each other that this, I have said from the very beginning, this campaign has never been about me. It's never been about Roy Moore. It has been about every one of you. Despite the Alabama Secretary of State already saying tonight that he could see no way to change the outcome of this election, including a recount, Roy Moore refused to concede. When the vote is this close, then it's not over. Part of what we've got to do is wait on God and let this process play out. Joining us now, MSNBC's Steve Kronacki. Steve, uh, the drama of the night was watching you uh, on the last word, what, what we thought was going to be the last word, 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern tonight, watching you take us through those numbers. Uh, we kept going back to you uh, nonstop throughout the hour. The drama unfolded right there on your map. Uh, recap for us. Uh, that hour and what you saw happening in that hour. Uh, yeah, it's every election junkie's dream to see it that close and, and that decisive in a stretch of time. We saw that was the hour when Jones started out behind and ended up the next senator from Alabama. So what happened? What went right for Jones? Well, first of all, the answer is basically everything went right. If you're a Democrat and you're winning by 20,000 votes, it's a tiny margin, but you need everything to break your way. He got three particularly big things. First of all, he got well, that's not what was supposed to happen there. Let's call that back up. First of all, he got not just overwhelming support from African Americans, he got huge turnout from African Americans. We were, oh, these are the heavily black counties in this sort of strip of the state right here. We were looking across the state tonight to see how turnout compared to the 
the presidential election last year, and what we found consistently across the counties here was the drop was a lot less in these counties, these heavily black counties in this part of the state than they were up here. These are heavily Republican, heavily white rural counties, and down here, heavily Republican, heavily white rural counties. So the Trump base from 16 in these parts of the states, a lot more of them dropped off and didn't participate today than you had here uh, in these heavily black counties. So that's number one, but that wouldn't be enough. Number two for the Democrat is they needed to make inroads into some of these traditionally uh, Republican suburbs. And this is a trend we've been seeing. We talked about this in the Virginia governor's race a couple weeks ago where Democrats in Northern Virginia outside D.C. I'll show you one. This is the catastrophe of the night, I think, for Republicans. Shelby County outside Birmingham. This is the, this is the highest concentration of people with a four-year college degree in the state of Alabama. It's a place where Mitt Romney won almost 80 percent of the vote a few years ago. Trump got 73 last year. Tonight, Roy Moore, a very meager 56 percent of the vote. If you're a Republican, this is where you're supposed to be racking up your biggest numbers in the state. Instead, less than 10,000 is the margin here. This is a big problem for Republicans in this Trump age, in this Trump era of politics. These are the types of voters in Alabama and across the country, these sort of white college educated suburbanites. This is the kind of place where Democrats think they can make inroads. They made big inroads there tonight. And number three, the third thing that went right for Democrats, I think of younger voters. Think of college age voters, recent college grads. Think of, think of the two big college towns in Alabama. Let's start right here. This is Lee County, home of Auburn University. This is a place Donald Trump won uh, last year with about 60% of the vote. Look at this now. 41% for Roy Moore. He got absolutely blown out here. Huge movement here. And if we go across the state, the arch rival of Auburn, the Alabama Crimson Tide, Tuscaloosa. Again, Donald Trump was winning easily here last year. Tonight, Roy Moore barely cracking 40%. We saw a huge movement in these sort of college counties as well. So you add it all together, and that's a 20,000 vote win for a Democrat. Like you said, you got to go back 20. And by the way, the last Democrat to win a Senate race in Alabama, he didn't even stay a Democrat right. for his full term. It didn't take. This one, I think, probably will, though. Right. right. Uh, that was Richard Shelby, who switched parties a couple of years in after that re-election and is now the senior senator from Alabama, Republican, who Steve, as you know, uh, said he publicly he would not, did not vote for Roy Moore. Uh, and it sounds like uh, voters in Alabama, if they were listening to anyone, uh, they listened more to Senator Shelby than they did to Donald Trump. Well, and it's interesting when we talk about that turnout difference, that's what I was thinking of when we were seeing those those sort of meager Republican turnout figures uh, in those counties. I'm thinking of Richard Shelby. I'm thinking of, you know, the reluctance he had to say anything about more than in the end to say he wasn't going to vote for him. You didn't have Republicans in these counties going out and switching parties and voting Democrat. You just didn't have them coming out at all. They weren't turning out. They weren't energized. And again, in these Democratic areas, you saw the opposite. Steve Kronacki, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you very much for that hour from 10 p.m. to 11 tonight. And I've heard from a lot of people around the country uh, who watched you guide them through an understanding of what was coming. Uh, and we were able to declare uh, the apparent winner by the end of the hour. Thank you, Steve. All right, very thanks, much. Lawrence. Anytime. Thank you. I want to take a look right now, a little bit more of Doug Jones, uh, before we go to David Frum and Maria Trace Kumar, Doug Jones' acceptance speech tonight, uh, victory speech, we should call it. Let's listen to this. This entire race has been about dignity and respect. This, this campaign... This campaign has been about the rule of law. This, cam this campaign has been about common courtesy and decency and making sure everyone in this state, regardless of which zip code you live in, is going to get a fair shake in life. And we are now joined by David Frum, senior editor for The Atlantic, and Maria Trace Kumar, president and CEO of Voto Latino and an MSNBC contributor. And Maria Teresa, to hear a candidate standing up there saying, in the age of Trump, this campaign has been about the rule of law. law. It's been about dignity and respect. It's been about common courtesy and decency. Those are all notes that uh, could not be sounded by Donald Trump. And it was back 
talking about the values that this country represents. And I think that is what the Alabama voters today not only were able to demonstrate, but they were also able to prove that in a state where Donald Trump won by 28 percent almost to the day last year, he failed miserably. It demonstrates that he has he's losing losing influence among his base. They were completely suppressed, as Steve Kornacki said earlier. But he also acknowledged, Doug Jones, in his acceptance, the value of bringing in a diversified group of voters to the voting booth. He acknowledged acknowledged African Americans, he had acknowledged the power of the Latino vote, he acknowledged the power of the youth vote. And this is where the Democratic Party, if they want to continue this wave, they have to pay attention. You, the only way that they are going to be able to bring in these types of voters is bringing in candidates such as Doug Jones, but also investing in the leadership of these different communities to prepare for 2018 and 2020. Lawrence, there are, we are expecting 12 million young voters to reach voting age by 2020. Two-thirds of them are those young people of color that, that Doug Jones talked about tonight. And uh, David, from uh, Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell had his big I told you so moment tonight, and he did not wait uh, for NBC News to actually call uh, this election. Before it was officially called by us, it had been called uh, by one or two other news organizations. Uh, Mitch McConnell's uh, leadership packs were putting out statements, uh, the Republican Senate Campaign Committee, uh, and also Mitch McConnell's pack uh, putting out statements condemning Roy Moore as an unfit candidate. Uh, for Senate. Pretty much the same language that Chuck Schumer used in his statement when he released a statement uh, saying that, that Roy Moore never should have been uh, even a candidate for the United States Senate. And so it's this odd moment where the Republican leader of the Senate is having an I told you so moment about this terrible candidate, about Steve Bannon pushing this terrible candidate, but the Republican leader of the Senate now has one less Republican vote. Right. This election is a double earthquake. An earthquake mm -hmm. first for the politics specifically of the Senate, and then an earthquake for the politics of the country. For, for the Senate, it means, I mean, I'm sure Mitch McConnell is very glad to see the back of Roy Moore, whom he openly despised. But he's, as you said, he's got no room for maneuver now. They're, they're moving this tax bill through. It's, the Senate version is extremely sloppy, so it will have to be redone, and it will be, have to be redone with a smaller margin even than last time. For the politics of the country, this, the thing that is such an earthquake about this is if you listen to Doug Jones, Doug, that statement he gave tonight, it wasn't a highly ideological statement. He said, this is about decency, this is about courtesy. He could have said, he didn't, this is about sexual abuse. This puts the issue of sexual abuse really now at the top of the electoral agenda. And who is the biggest and most visible sexual abuser in an elected office in the United States? The president. Uh, just today, the president's press spokesman, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, tried to dismiss all of these allegations against Donald Trump as pre-litigated, yesterday's business of no interest to anybody. Well, Republicans just lost Alabama on this issue. They can lose Alabama. They can certainly lose Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin on the same issue. Maria Teresa, we have such uh, strange calculations to make here. For example, uh, is it better or worse for Donald Trump that Roy Moore won't be going to the Senate? That you could make the argument that it would be better for Donald Trump if Roy Moore were going to the Senate because the Senate would then be consumed with accusations against Roy Moore. Those accusations now won't be going to Washington. Washington won't be considering those. There is now clear aim in Washington at the accusations against Donald Trump for sexual harassment and sexual assault. There's nothing in the way, nothing else to discuss on that front now uh, that's more important than Donald Trump's, the accusations against Donald Trump. That's absolutely right. And I think that today what we have to do is we actually have to thank the bravery of those women that came forward and broke their stories after carrying that for so long. They finally, you know, they, they stepped up and said, this is what happened to me. This is what th this person, Roy Moore, what his real values are. And we need to applaud their bravery because they, they took big hits b for coming forward. Now Donald Trump is going to have a reckoning of his own because he can no longer, as you said, have the Senate f uh, firmly look at Roy Moore's record and question whether or not these accusations were true. Now, because the voters of Alabama came out with a resounding rejection of him, now Donald Trump is going to be in the literally in the crosshairs of, of folks saying, you know, the Me Too actually applies to you as well. And David, as you know, when a new administration comes in and they are considering uh, appointing members of the Senate to the cabinet, you always look at the state where you might be uh, taking the senator and say, well, what happened?
happens? Do we, do we, the, do, will that seat, sw uh, seat switch parties? You look at Alabama and you think, of course we can make Jeff Sessions right. Attorney General. Of course that's going to be a Republican seat forever. And that is Jeff Sessions' seat that is now a Democratic seat. And this is thanks entirely to the age of Trump. Look, there are a very specific series of miscalculations that Republicans made, more than one that delivered the seat up to the Democrats. Um, they had their own state scandal, which is what doomed Luther Strange, who certainly would have won this race. Um, so Republicans can comfort themselves. Look, if we just played this hand a little less incompetently, we should have won the seat. But the harder question is, well, why? Did the Republicans play this hand so badly? Mm -hmm. It was why this terrible series of decisions. There is a deeper dysfunction that has seized the party. That means that it, if if you're losing the easy games, what happens if you have to play the hard games? David, quickly, right. uh, we're, we're going to a commercial break in a second. But how does how do Washington Republicans view Steve Bannon when they wake up tomorrow morning and see who the incoming senator is from Alabama? They start saying in public what they've been saying in private. And that would all be negative about Steve Bannon, I take it. That, that would be, that would, uh, well, that, that would be negative. That, like that would be <laughs> negative on a scale. And, and, and a lot of the stuff that has been only, which I'm not going to say on the air because I don't know it to be true, but, but that has been whispered about him, I think that may also begin to be said in public. Thank you for respecting the economy of language needed when we are approaching the commercial break. Thank you very much. Coming up, Donald Trump's endorsement did not persuade the majority of Alabama voters today. It was a big loss for Donald Trump and for Steve Bannon. We now have the first video of Steve Bannon's reaction tonight. Get out and vote for Roy Moore. Do it, do it, do it. I couldn't vote for Roy Moore. The state of Alabama deserves better. Well, Trump gave Alabama voters a direct order, do it, do it, and Alabama voters paid more attention to their Republican Senator Richard Shelby than they did to President Trump. And an editorial the New York Times tonight says, a triumph for decency and common sense in a state that seemed for a time at risk of abandoning both. Mr. Jones's win narrows the Republican Senate majority and delivers a deeply deserved rebuke to President Trump. Joining the discussion now, Corinne Jean-Pierre, Senior Advisor and National Spokesperson for MoveOn.org. Also with us, Ron Klain, the former Chief of Staff to Vice Presidents Joe Biden and Al Gore, and a former Senior Aide to President Obama. And back with us, Maria Teresa Kumar. Uh, Corinne, uh, this is, as the New York Times uh, puts it, a deeply deserved rebuke to Donald Trump. It is. It is a, a big smackdown to Donald Trump, indeed. And it's not once, but twice. As we know, he was uh, he had supported Luther Luther Strange, who was corrupt. And even when he supported Luther Strange, you knew, you kind of had that feeling that he really wanted to be with Roy Moore, the bigot. Um, and then he had his opportunity to do that and went out and campaigned for him. It, it, well, even though it was in Florida, he was still campaigning for him. It was clear what he was doing. Did a robocall, as we just heard. And it was a smackdown once again, uh, twice and twice uh, in just in a couple of months in Alabama. And let's not what ha let's not forget what happened in in Virginia and New Jersey just a couple of weeks ag weeks ago. And we got and we don't we have to remember uh, Alabama's a ruby red state. He won it by 28 uh, percent, 28 points last time around. And this is where we are today. What voters saying? No way, no how. Ron Klain, a uh, big surprise. The self-admitted sexual assaulter uh, endorses the accused child molester and the accused child molester loses. Uh, I thought that's the way that equation was supposed to come out and it did. Yeah, Lawrence, I think uh, it's a huge loss for Trump for the reasons just stated, for the obviously loss of a Senate seat and putting the Senate in play in 2018, but I think most of all for the reason you just mentioned. I, I think the fact that Roy Moore was a predator was not a factor that kept Donald Trump from endorsing him, but was a desirable factor in this candidacy for Donald Trump. He thought today he would be able to say, see, the voters decided this doesn't matter. See, shut up, stop talking about the women who are accusing to me. The voters put a child molester in the Senate. And instead of putting this to rest, 
uh, the rebuke that we got, that that movement got, that, 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 that idea, Trump idea got, in the sixth most Republican state in the country is a wake-up call that this Me Too movement has huge momentum, even in red states, and that uh, there's a reckoning coming for President Trump on this issue. Okay, we now have the video of Steve Bannon tonight, uh, his first reaction uh, to this huge defeat for Steve Bannon personally. And uh, we're, we're going to show it in just a second. Uh, and the only hint I have for you before you see it is Steve Bannon is speechless. Let's take a look at this. Steve Bannon, this is, this is a huge defeat for you. Now, uh, we don't have ready to go all that video of Steve Bannon standing up with the microphone doing his stand-up routine in Alabama, uh, having more to say about this than, uh, than he knew. Uh, but Maria Teresa, there he is tonight uh, getting into the Escalade and doesn't have a word to say. Well, because he lost famously. He went to, Oklahoma, uh, to Alabama more times than even President Trump. He thought that this was a, a slam dunk. Again, President Trump won Alabama just a year ago by 28 points, and this was literally the Alabama voters saying that not only did they not like the brand of Steve Bannon, but they did not actually like the brand of Donald Trump. And let's not look at this in a vacuum. The fact that the, that the president also lost in a bigly way in Virginia and New Jersey, but also across the state, there is a wave coming. And the one that's going to, the person who's going to wake up with heartburn, while Mitch McConnell today said, you know, you, I told you so, tomorrow he's going to wake up with heartburn because now the Senate is definitely in play. Look at Nevada, look at, at Arizona, mm -hmm. where you have a large group of Latino voters coming their way saying, we're not going to actually support this type of presidency or the type of brand that Steve Bannon claims to be of the Republican Party. I think uh, Alabama and the country deserves to see Steve Bannon one more time uh, in his <laughs> reaction tonight because it is so quick and also because this is someone who went to Alabama to spread his particular brand of poison and try to elect this accused child molester and he looked as though he felt so victorious uh, on those stages with that microphone but let's take one more look at Steve Bannon tonight after he was crushed in this election in Alabama. Mr. Bannon, this is, this is a huge defeat for you. Uh, Kareen, and I just want to let the control room know, if you want to just run that in the box in the corner for the rest of the hour, that's going to be all right with us. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll make some room on the screen. Uh, Kareen, you, I, it's, it's rare to see uh, a political strategist go in such, uh, I mean, we've never seen a political strategist who claims to be a political strategist, uh, which he's never been paid to do no. before, uh, to go in this kind of direction. Mitch McConnell said this guy was going to destroy the party. Uh, and if, if there's a Republican left who doesn't think Mitch McConnell's right, I, I don't know who that could be. <laughs> right. I mean, right. St Steve Bannon wanted to, as he has always done, wanted to stick it to uh, Mitch McConnell and the Republican Party. That's what this was all about. I mean, look, Steve Bannon is a blowhard. The only thing he's ever won was clearly last year with Donald Trump, but he didn't even run that campaign. Uh, he was not the campaign manager, but he came in there with his toxic brand and tried to prove that he was something that he's not, which is, a, which is I guess, a, a deal maker or, or he, a delivery or a real strategist and right what we saw is the emperor has no clothes um, not that I want to see that but it is indeed what is <laughs> happening with uh, Steve Bannon all right, we're going to have to take a break here. Uh, the, there's a pretty shocking exit poll result about uh, President Trump's approval rating in Alabama, which is which we're going to have when we come back. We're going to have much more ahead about Doug, Doug Jones' stunning and truly historic victory for a Democrat in an Alabama Senate rate race. But before we go, let's just take one more quick look at Steve Bannon's glorious moment tonight after this election. Mr. Bannon, this is, this is a huge defeat for you. Tonight is a night for rejoicing, because as Dr. King said, as Dr. King liked to quote, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Tonight, in this time, in this place, 
You helped bend that moral art a little closer to that justice, and you did it. That moral art, not only was it bent more, not only was its aim truer, but you sent it right through the heart of the great state of Alabama in doing so. And uh, Corinne Jump here, uh, I haven't been able to check this thoroughly, but that may be the very first time that a victorious Senate candidate in Alabama quoted Martin Luther King Jr. That, that, that would probably be right. I mean, it's also been 20 years since a Democrat has been, uh, has been a, a U.S. Senator in the state of Alabama. Uh, even uh, Senator Shelby, he was a Democrat and, and switched over in 94. I mean, this is really huge. Democrats had no business um, really being competitive in that state, but you had a, a, a great candidate like Doug Jones, and then you had um, a, a horrible candidate in Roy Moore a pedophile, a bigot, uh, a homophobe, an Islamophobe, I mean, you name it, every horrible isms that you can think of in Roy Moore, and, uh, and, and, the, um, and, and the people came out, Alabama came out and they spoke. I think what we saw in November for the after Virginia, New Jersey election, we saw that the resistance was electoralized, and tonight we saw the Me Too movement was electoralized, uh, the women were electoralized, and I think that's, 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 that's the result of this evening. Now, as we saw in the previous segment, the humiliated and crushed Steve Bannon is literally speechless tonight, could not say a word to the press as he uh, slipped into his car to disappear from Alabama. He may be speechless, but his aide, uh, Andy Sorabian, Sur uh, has responded this way tonight. After doing everything in their power to throw this election to a liberal Democrat, the McConnell establishment should expect the very same America First movement that elected the president in 2016 to be out for their blood in 2018. And Ron Klain, uh, it is as if some evil genius in the Democratic Party created these people who call themselves Republicans, who are out for the blood of the Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Yeah, you know, if we had created them, people would say that wasn't a believable character because no. they were just too evil, too incompetent, and too heavy-handed to be believable as villains in some, uh, you know, television comedy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny and it's not funny. I mean, I think the kind of hatred that Steve Bannon and his allies represent is uh, sadly an old force in America, but it has been reinvigorated and come back to life in its most extreme form. You know, Roy Moore didn't run as a modern right wing neglect the role that black voters mm -hmm. played in this election. They were the margin of victory tonight. They came out in force. They delivered this. And this was a stinging rebuke by black voters to someone who really wanted to turn the clock back 100 years in Alabama. Let's yeah. take a look at the exit polls now, beginning with the simplest, the male-female uh, breakdown in the exit polls. And in that, you see something very simple, and that is that the women won this race for Doug Jones. It was very simply uh, women versus men in this election, uh, and the women at 57% uh, uh, go for uh, Doug Jones, 56% of men go for uh, Roy Moore, and the winner is Doug Jones. Let's go inside that uh, women's vote for a moment here and look at the, we, we can see within white women and black women, uh, in white women, uh, Jones lost white women, 34 to 63. Black women, Jones won 98 to 2. And so, uh, on uh, Maria Trace, on what Ron was just saying, it is very clearly the women, and you could say specifically the black women who delivered this election. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And what you're seeing is this is what happens when you actually use the opportunity to build the infrastructure and do the hard work, which is back to basics, talking to voters, making very clear that they are the ones that are going to change the country. And I have to share, not only did he, when he did his acceptance speech, did Doug Jones point out the black voters, but he also talked about the youth voters, recognizing that our country right now, Donald Trump's election was based along generational lines. And that is only getting to get deeper. And as you start moving more towards the West Coast, you have even a younger generation 
generation of young voters and African Americans and Latinos all coming of age who just do not like this president. And I think that is where Steve Bannon is missing the calculation. Demographics is not destiny. You have to invest and make sure that these people come out. But the fact that you had someone that, as Ron just mentioned, was for slavery, did not believe to, uh, of an enfranchised voter, this is what the African American community was able to do despite some of the strictest voting rights mm -hmm. uh, prevent and disenfranchisement that we see across the country. This is what they were able to do despite that, but that was because people came out and actually built the infrastructure to share with them and ensure that they were getting out their vote. And uh, Kareen, the, there hasn't been a close Senate election in Alabama since 1986 when Richard Shelby won his first election as a Democrat. Uh, that was a very close one. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Sessions, the, the seat that we were filling tonight was Jeff Sessions' seat. The last time that seat uh, was up for election, 2014, Jeff Sessions won that seat with 97 percent yeah. of the vote 97 the democrats could not even come up with an opponent to jeff sessions uh this is how far they've come in that same seat tonight where the republicans won 97 the last time it was up uh the democrat wins yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, just to tag on to what everybody else was saying about the black vote, I mean, black women are the backbone uh, to, of the Democratic Party, and I hope that the Democratic Party sees that and really invest, because what Alabama did do is that they put together the largest um, out, uh, getting out the vote operation that they've ever had, at least Democrats have ever had, as, as we're talking about uh, Jeff Sessions winning by 97 uh, percent the last time in 2014, and they just put put it together, like I said, had a great candidate, had the message, put out there, put, put the infrastructure and the money on the ground, and really reached out to voters, and it paid off. It was a night of two huge surprises in Alabama. One, a Democrat winning a Senate seat, and two, a tweet from Donald Trump, which was a very uncharacteristic tweet, and we're going to have that tweet from the president coming up after a break. As the drama in Alabama unfolded here earlier tonight at MSNBC, we all looked to Steve Kornacki and his magical map. It's skeletal, it's sketchy, it's early. You can see here about a quarter of the vote in. This is a narrow race. It's a question of is it going to be just enough or is it going to be just short for Democrats? When it gets this close, oh, we got another. Jones has taken the lead. There we are. Where else could more get votes? He's now behind. He's got to manufacture votes. Every single red county in the area I, I just circled here has 100% of the precincts reporting. He's not getting any more votes out of there. I'm sitting here, I'm trying to give you some kind of more scenario. I can't come up with one. And NBC News is now calling Doug Jones the apparent winner in this special Senate election in Alabama. Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering when that was going to happen, yeah. so there you go. And back with us, Maria Teresa Kumar and Corrine Jean-Pierre. And uh, Corrine, it was fun to watch Steve Kornacki because I yes. knew he knew where this was going and he couldn't <laughs> say because yes. he hadn't, we didn't officially have the call. And so it was, it was fascinating to watch him come up with different ways of saying it's impossible <laughs> for Roy Moore to win. Uh, see, it's always fun to watch Steve Kornacki uh, on election night. He always uh, brings brings it. Um, uh, I guess uh, I guess for me for this night uh, we are you know Lawrence we're living in unusual times. We have a a president Donald Trump who is divisive and hateful and obstructing justice. Um, and uh, what we've been seeing these last two, uh, especially the last two elections, is in, in this year when I'm talking about November and now today is that we're seeing a movement, the resistance movement that is really uh, stepping up, speaking up and being electoralized, as I mentioned earlier, and they are not taking this anymore. And they're rebuking what the hateful things that Donald Trump is doing, what the GOP is trying to do. And, uh, and I think this is a great sign for 2018. It's a great boost for the Democratic Party. And, uh, and I think we're just going to continue that. One thing I do want uh, to add to that is, uh, I, there's
members, that I'm hearing that Mitch McConnell, I think he made a statement about not seating, it was regardless if it was going to be Doug Jones or Roy Moore who won tonight, not seating uh, essentially Doug Jones uh, and letting Luther Strange sit till the end of the year. And I just want to remind him that in 2010, uh, when Scott Brown won as U.S. Senator in Massachusetts, uh, Harry Reid decided to hold all major votes, including health care, uh, until Scott Brown was seated. And that he took it, it he waited 16 days for that to happen. And uh, Marie Tracy, there is some question as to how long it's going to take Alabama to certify uh, these results. And there are estimates that they can't get it certified until after Christmas, around the 27th. And then you're pretty much at the, you, you are at the end of the, beyond the end of the calendar year for the Senate anyway. So this, uh, it's hard to say uh, exactly how that's going to work, when this seating is going to take place. That's right. But the good news is, is that the Alabama Secretary said that say, state said that they're not going mm -hmm. to contest the vote, even though Roy Moore wanted, wants to. And I think that actually puts a good place forward for Mitch McConnell to do the right thing and make sure that Doug Jones is seated representing the people of Alabama. But this also puts a lot of pause in Mitch McConnell and the Republican strategy because many were expecting Roy Moore to win. Now they have to take a step back and really think, Am I go are we going to be able to ta pass this? Tax, uh, tax bill that the majority of Americans think, believe is bad for them. This all of a sudden also gives breath into immigration reform so that they can actually perhaps do, pass some, some piece on the, the, on the dreamers. It also makes sure that the Democrats have much more leverage and the Republicans have to stay put. And if I were the president, he must be incredibly concerned of what the, what the Senate is going to look like by the end of 2018. And if I were members of, of the Senate that are running that supported Roy Moore, like Ted Cruz, when he was asked whether or not Roy Moore should be seated, and he said, sure, why not? Those are going to come, those are going to be ads that are going to come back and hurt him in a Texas primary. The fact today that the state legislator, uh, excuse me, the Texas Democratic Party said that they were going to contest every single seat is a demonstration that not only does the Democratic Party believe that there's a wind in their sails, but but more importantly, that the American people are paying attention, that they are participating, that the best thing that coming out of a Trump presidency is that the American people recognize the importance of their vote, the importance of participating, and making sure that they are heard. And I think that what we saw in Virginia with the slate of candidates also represents the diversity of what the Democratic, the progressive movement truly is. And the Democrats actually, the Democratic leadership has to take a step and recognize that the people, when they choose to run, we have to ensure that they are being supported appropriately because there is, a, there is a sea change happening in this country. But people have to buckle up, do the hard work, and make sure that we're paying attention. Maria Teresa Kumar and Karine Jean Pierre, thank you both for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thank Lawrence. you, Lawrence. Coming up, President Trump's tweeted reaction to Doug Jones' victory. That's next. I have this challenge to my future colleagues in Washington. Don't wait on me. Take this election from the great state of Alabama. Let me finish. Take this election. Take this election where the people of Alabama said, we want to get something done. We want you to find common ground. We want you to talk. Take this opportunity in, in light of this election and go ahead and fund that SHIP program before I get up there. That's Senator-elect Doug, Doug Jones already trying to affect the Senate's legislative agenda. Tonight, the president, in an uncharacteristic tweet, tweeted this about the election. Congratulations to Doug Jones on a hard-fought victory. The write-in votes played a very big factor, but a win is a win. The people of Alabama are great, and the Republicans will have another shot at this seat in a very short period of time. It never ends, exclamation point. And we're joined again by David Frum and Ron Klain. And first of all, David Frum, uh, it seems impossible that the president could have written that tweet, uh, both the sentiment and the uh, correct punctuation, spelling, sentence structure. Those are all uncharacteristic qualities in a Trump tweet. What do you make of it? Uh, the absence of rage as well. Um, what I make of it is uh, th that Republicans are persuading themselves that somehow they can use the um, fact that Doug Jones only has a two-year term to discipline him. That's that's the hint at the at the end of that message. Um, I and 
Doug Jones knows that as well as anybody. I don't think he will be um, the, the liberal dream boat senator uh, that um, many people are expecting tonight. He will be a senator for Alabama. He will be ambitious. Uh, but Donald Trump, if Donald Trump is thinking that he's got impeachment insurance from Doug Jones, that may be a big mistake. Ron Klain, I, I read it as Donald Trump's first lobbying of Doug Jones on a possible tax cut vote in the Senate. You know, Lawrence, I read it, uh, my friend Dan Pfeiffer tonight said, I read it as if uh, uh, Don Trump's lawyer got a hold of his Twitter account and <laughs> yeah. uh, tweeted on his behalf. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't believe that's Donald Trump, and I'm anxious to see what the morning Donald Trump tweet looks like right. on this. But look, I think if Donald Trump is kidding himself, Republicans are kidding themselves, if they think the only reason they lost in Alabama is because Roy Moore was a flawed candidate. He obviously was, uh, and a, a horribly flawed candidate. But uh, Trump and his policies were also on the ballot in Alabama, and they also lost tonight. And I think every Republican senator uh, has to be looking at that tax bill. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing accomplishment that you could cut people's taxes and build one of the most unpopular pieces of legislation in American history, cutting people's taxes. And they have to be looking at that and ask themselves, do we really want to go forward? Uh, are we going to take the heat on this? Uh, and, and, and they have to see in tonight's results a lot of questioning about this very partisan way of legislating they've been pursuing. It's hardball legislation. I think the Jones victory is a rebuke of that, and I think they're going to take note of that. And, uh, David, we, we see Republicans now uh, seeing problems in their tax bill that they didn't. Yeah. Uh, the, for example, House Republicans, Darrell Issa now, working hard to change something that he voted for in the House bill that hurts California taxpayers significantly on the deductibility of state and local taxes, property taxes, income taxes, uh, and also another provision that eliminates uh, tax deductibility of losses in wildfires, which has suddenly, to Darrell Issa's uh, and other Republican members uh, of the House in California, become important. Why it wasn't important before the wildfires broke out, I don't know. But when you see those kinds of tensions uh, being brought to uh, legislation that people like Darrell Issa already voted for, every vote counts. And Donald Trump being nice tonight to the newly elected senator from Alabama uh, can all be part of the lobbying that he sees he may, that, that's, that people in the White House know he should be doing to try to win an Alabama Democrat's vote. As vulnerable as the Republican uh, majority in the Senate is on taxes, I don't think this is the greatest point of vulnerability. Here, the, the Donald Trump administration is, is planning a big reorganization of American foreign policy. They want to move Tillerson out of state, move uh, Mike Pompeo from CIA to state, and put somebody, maybe Tom Cotton, into CIA. That's two confirmation votes. Um, they don't have Bob Corker's vote, very probably, the chairman of the Republican Foreign Relations Committee. So that's one down with Doug, uh, Doug Jones, they are not, that's another vote down. And if, even if Donald Trump can get confirmations, he cannot avoid the kind of searching questioning that has been avoided in the past. So foreign policy is about to move to a great extent beyond his total control as he's had it till now. Ron Klain, I was struck by the one legislative item uh, that Doug Jones uh, mentioned tonight, CHIP, yeah. uh, Children's uh, Health Insurance Program, uh, because you know, you worked in the Senate uh, not that long ago, it feels to us, uh, Ron, when we had a half a dozen Democratic uh, senators from the South, from Georgia, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, Louisiana, and both of the, the senators from Alabama, Democrats, they frequently did not vote with the Democrats, even on important important legislation, uh, and the Democrats understood it. They managed to get themselves over 50 without them because they had 57 Democrats at the time. And so it is entirely possible that now that we have a Democratic senator from Alabama, that he will be under more pressure to vote with the Republicans than Joe Manchin is, uh, Claire McCaskill, and some of the other uh, Democrats who the Republicans occasionally target. I think that's right, Lawrence, but I do think there's two things worth pointing out here. First of all, uh, the fact that he mentioned CHIP is a reminder that a lot of these things that maybe we used to think of as liberal are now just very mainstream, have broad support in the country. There's broad support for relief for the dreamers. There's broad support for funding children's health care. And the extremeness of the Republican Party is moving off the cliff on some of these issues. And Doug Jones is a reminder of that. But I think the most amazing thing we've seen in 27 as a Senate veteran, and you worked up there, you know, the, the Democrats in the Senate have been united. It's the Republicans who are fraying on a lot 
lot of these close votes. And even Manchin, even uh, Joe Donnelly in Indiana, even Claire McCaskill in Missouri have stood together against Trump's agenda because Trump is so incompetent and so extreme, it's not a hard vote for them. And if that's what Trump keeps doing, I think that's where Doug Jones will line up too. Ron Klain, David Frum, thank you both very much for staying Thanks, with us Lawrence. tonight. Really appreciate it. Tonight's last word is next. The three big losers of the night were Roy Moore, who refused to concede defeat, pretending there was some chance of changing the outcome of this election, and Steve Bannon, who had cheered on the Roy Moore candidacy, and President Trump. Those are the big three losers of the night. Here's how President Trump reacted to being one of the big losers of the night. He tweeted, congratulations to Doug Jones on a hard-fought victory. The write-in votes played a very big factor, but a win is a win. The people of Alabama are great, and the Republicans will have another shot at this seat in a very short period of time. It never ends, and of course, for years, Trump scholars will be trying to figure out who really wrote that tweet. And let's take one more look at Steve Bannon's reaction to the defeat tonight. Mr. Bannon, this is, this is a huge defeat for you. Steve Bannon gets tonight's last word, which for him is the complete silence of utter humiliation. That's tonight's last word. Hardball starts now.